Mayor David, the live stream has started and uh, I turn the meeting over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Earlier this morning, uh, we met in closed session and council rose from this meeting at 9.20. During the session, direction uh, to staff was provided with respect to a partnership, uh, potential partnership opportunity. So I'm now going to call the uh, meeting back to order at 9, uh, 9.30, pardon me. So the first item we have this morning are our delegations, presentations, and petitions. Uh, the first one is a presentation from Dean Croker. Welcome, Dean, I see you there. Uh, I'll introduce you as a detachment commander for Middlesex County West Region from the Ontario Provincial Police. And if you'd like to uh, make your presentation, the floor is yours. Thank you, Worship. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for this invitation to uh, meet with you briefly this morning. Uh, yeah, what I've been asked to do is just provide a, uh, a brief overview as to uh, the uh, policing within Millsec Centre and just uh, some highlights as to uh, what's uh, gone on over the last uh, period of time. And uh, I'll just uh, extend my, uh, my availability. I can uh, meet with council anytime if uh, you'd like a, a much more in-depth report of policing. So I, uh, uh, Michael was kind enough to give me uh, about 10 minutes. So I'll give you a quick snapshot and I'll respect everybody's time, but I, uh, if this uh, conversation brings on thoughts or questions, I can always come back. <clears throat> Uh, so I, I shared a PowerPoint presentation with, uh, with James, and if that's been shared with you, I, what I'll do is I'll just go over each of the pages. Uh, the, the first page um, is what we kind of look at our calls for service, and it's broken down into the uh, uh, most common uh, criminal categories that are used by uh, Stats Canada for collecting uh, uh, statistical purposes for policing. So violent, and I've uh, used two years as a comparison. So uh, calendar year of 2021 versus 2020. Uh, so for Middlesex Center, uh, the violent crime in 2021 went down from the previous year. Uh, and the violent crime, those categories are just that the crimes are, are uh, possessed violence. So assaults, fights, uh, assaults with weapons, uh, sexual assaults. Uh, in uh, 2021, where we saw the biggest decrease in uh, in that category was in uh, simple assaults, which would be your uh, typical fights, just uh, where punches or kicks are thrown, or, and uh, sexual assaults also were down. And typically for our communities, well, not typically, it, it's the norm, for sexual assaults, they are not uh, a sexual assault where it's a predator uh, type of occurrence, it's a known persons, whether it's a relationship or uh, ex-relationship, the, the two parties know one another, uh, but happy to report that the, uh, there's a significant drop in sexual assaults uh, from last year. Uh, property crime, which is obviously always a, a huge concern for our communities, uh, also saw a drop in 2021 versus 2020, uh, which is uh, uh, which was good to see because uh, between 2020 and 2019, we had seen a drop in property crime because of COVID. Uh, more people were home in 2020, uh, businesses were closed, uh, and we had seen a decrease. So to see a, a further decrease uh, from 2021, uh, when our uh, society and our businesses were slowly getting back to normal, uh, is, a, is a positive sign. Where the uh, biggest decrease is in the uh, property crime areas, and property crime is your break and enters, your thefts, uh, property damage, mischiefs. Uh, where Middlesex Center saw the biggest decrease was uh, theft of motor vehicles and theft uh, so theft from motor vehicles is typically the unlocked doors, people leaving change, uh, uh, laptops, anything that's of value in their cars and were uh, quite often they're left unlocked. Those, uh, that, that area dropped significantly and uh, actually theft of motor vehicles. So cars, trucks being stolen was also uh, a drop from 2020, or sorry, in 2021 versus 2020. Uh, statutes and acts, there's an increase there and I'll, uh, my next uh, slide, will I'll get into that explanation a little bit more, but what the statutes and acts covers is uh, mental health calls are what we call a provincial statute. So trespassing, uh, landlord tenant act, those type of uh, non-serious uh, police investigations, but there's still, uh, uh, there's still charges that can be laid under the provincial statutes. Uh, where we saw the, uh, the increase in uh, for male sex center, uh, for 2021 was mental health calls, which uh, unfortunately is uh, is the norm. Uh, mental health calls are going, across, going up across uh, 
uh, the county and really in policing everywhere. Every municipality has seen an increase in uh, mental health calls. Uh, and then the other one, there was uh, a bit of a, a spike in landlord tenant uh, disputes uh, versus 2020. Uh, operational calls. This is our uh, probably the, the, the biggest category of uh, calls for service that are non-criminal nature. So these are uh, noise complaints, uh, found property, suspicious persons, uh, investigations that we do where we don't lay charges or there is no charge to lay. And there was a decrease in those, uh, those type of calls from uh, nearly, well, just over hundred uh, from 2020 to 2021. Uh, operational two calls, this category includes uh, false alarms for businesses, homes, uh, 911 hangups, uh, pocket dials. Uh, and that's, uh, that category is stayed relatively the same from year to year. Uh, there's just a slight drop in it, but the categories inside for false alarms, uh, business uh, premises, whether it's uh, residential or business alarms, and our 911 hangups or uh, pocket dials have relatively stayed the same. Uh, unfortunately, where we see an increase, uh, and it's not one that we're particularly happy with, is traffic collisions. Uh, There's 440 for 2021 versus 389. Uh, though there, there, there is slightly some. Uh, Good news in that is that the where we see the biggest increase in traffic collisions occurred with property damage. So the no injuries. So uh, typically, and uh, I, I know everybody in, uh, that I'm speaking to right now and maybe listening will know that the uh, in Middlesex County and Middlesex Center is no uh, is uh, not exempt from this. Uh, the fall we have uh, a spike in our collisions because of deer, and that's uh, that's a common occurrence. And that's where that uh, category is where property damage reports come out of. So there's no injuries, just, just damage to the vehicle. Uh, in 2021, uh, fatal motor vehicle accidents were down from 2020. Uh, there was only one fatal accident in Millsex Center in 2021, um, which is still one too many, but uh, a decrease is, uh, is always good to see. So uh, that's uh, really, that's, it's a very quick snapshot as to your, the calls for service for your, your municipality. Uh, overall, your uh, billable service hours are down uh, based off of the decrease in this uh, in this report, uh, and our uh, the actual calls for service themselves are down. So that uh, that will uh, transfer into a savings when it comes to the uh, the billing model or into the uh, the billing com coming out from uh, our municipal policing bureau. All right, I can move on to the uh, next slide, uh, and it's. It so what, uh, th this next slide is uh, actually something that I'm very proud of. Um, the, the OPP, Middlesex OPP, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association and Strathroy Caradoc Police uh, back in 2020 uh, had been, well, actually we started in the latter part of 2019 and then through 2020, uh, even with COVID, we were able to still make some progress. And what we wanted to do was partner up and have uh, clinicians, mental health clinicians working with us uh, in our detachments or in the uh, Strathroy Caradoc Police Service to deal with mental health calls. Because as, as I mentioned previously, our mental health calls are, uh, are increasing yearly. Uh, when we looked at uh, this project with mental with Canadian Mental Health Association, we looked at uh, 2016 to 2019 as a uh, call for service regarding to mental health. And in that period of time, there had been a 66% increase in mental health calls in just those three years, uh, which poses problems in a number of different ways for, uh, for the police. It's uh, a lot of time where we're taking people to hospital to, uh, to have them assessed by uh, physicians to see if they are truly uh, uh, need mental health care or if they can be released back into, uh, uh, into, back into society or back home. Uh, Policing has received uh, an absolute uh, massive increase in mental health training. However, we are not experts. Uh, and I'll be the first one to say that we should not be dealing with mental health calls by ourselves, uh, but by just by necessity, uh, because we are one of the only services that is available by a phone call 24-7 uh, with the mental health uh, closure or the closure of mental health hospitals, more uh, mental health uh, patients being uh, in, uh, in society we became the stopgap to deal with that. Uh, now, provincially, what, uh, what we're talking about now is gonna be, uh, there'll be different models that are being coming out and, it's, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. 
but these mobile crisis response teams, there's a couple different versions, but the one that the Middlesex OPP has as well as Strathroy Caradoc is that we have a mental health clinician riding with one of our officers. And so when a mental health call comes in, they, they respond to that call. And uh, if it's safe to do so, if there's no violence, there's no, uh, no weapons, the clinician and the officer that they're riding with will then take over the call. And in uh, 2021, we had 125 live calls, which means that that was 125 calls that the clinician went to with one of our officers. And right now, we only have one clinician and, uh, uh, and actually in both, we share uh, with uh, Strathroy Caradoc. So we each have our own uh, clinician, but we uh, switch back and forth so that the uh, clinicians get exposure to the municipal policing side versus the uh, rural OPP side. Uh, with uh, both clinicians working with us, uh, they can only work 40 hours a week. So our, we looked at our peak times for mental health calls, which is, the last time we looked at it was from about nine o'clock in the morning till 7 p.m. So we have the uh, clinicians working essentially uh, 8.30 to 4.30. Uh, and after those hours, then the, uh, uh, the responsibility comes back to uh, the police. What's, what has been an, an actual positive uh, spinoff of this relationship with Canadian Mental Health is our officers are now being able to see how mental health clinicians are dealing with these calls live. Uh, what type of steps, strategies uh, they're using to de-escalate, and our officers are now in uh, bringing those into their uh, into the repertoire of uh, their own skill sets when they're dealing with uh, mental health calls when uh, our clinicians aren't working. So that was 125 calls that were essentially a uh, Monday to Friday, uh, eight to four. The uh, follow-up calls, because now what happens is our clinician and our uh, our, our mental health officer. They follow up with all the people that they've had contact with, making sure that the uh, they either if they haven't made referrals at the time that they're going back to make the appropriate referrals to the uh, the person who was in crisis or to their family members in support, uh, and that uh, resulted in 924 different uh, follow up calls with uh, members in our community, with the goal of those calls not being uh, diverted back to police to deal with in an emergency situation. And we have our repeat. Uh, we do have some uh, some members of the community that we would say are repeat callers for mental health. They are in crisis. Uh, those repeat calls are dropping uh, because of the follow up and the uh, the kind of one on one care they're receiving from our uh, our MSERP team, mobile crisis response team. Uh, in 2021, uh, Canadian Mental Health, based off of their stats, uh, report that they have that we diverted 84 people from the hospital, which is significant. Uh, in two folds. The diversion from hospital, so prior to having the clinician working with the OPP, uh, anytime that our officers were uh, dealing with a person in crisis, unless there was really a safe way to deal with the person that they could be left at home, we were taking them to the hospital. And part of that was also liability uh, to ensure, because we're not mental health experts. Uh, we wanted that person to get checked out by uh, hospital staff who would then make a decision whether that person needed to be uh, uh, held for a mental health assessment or if they could be released. So with the uh, diversions that, we, that occurred in uh, 2021, there was 84 diversions. So that was 84 times that two police officers didn't have to go to the hospital uh, in uh, LHSC in London. That's where it's a schedule one facility and that's where all mental health patients eventually have to go. And that's uh, that, transfers or that equates to uh, the time that was saved because our average wait time right now and there's things in place too that we're going to work on that with the hospital is about three hours for the officers to wait in the hospital to see a physician for that physician to say uh, yes this person needs to be uh, formed into uh, for an assessment or no I don't think they are a threat to themselves or anybody else they can be released back into their own care or family care. So when it's uh, when we work at the math at an average of three and a half hour wait time, it equates to that there's 46 12 hour shifts that we did not spend in the hospital. So that's 46 12 hour shifts that we were actually back in the community, uh, providing proactive or reactive policing to our community. So this uh, this program has uh, uh, has shown great uh, benefits to us, and the really and the the important thing the, the human uh, factor side into it. 
there's uh, those diversions. That was uh, 84 people that were not, as we tried to uh, reduce the stigma of mental health, there's 84 people that weren't taken to the hospital, escorted into the hospital by two police officers, uh, sat in likely a, a public area of the hospital, uh, unless there's a private room for them to sit, and having people look at them and wondering what's going on. Uh, so that's uh, that's really that's a, a huge benefit for our community members who were in crisis that uh, they weren't exposed to that uh, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, procedure to to be seen at the hospital. So that's uh, what uh, we have in addition to this now uh, for the. 2020, so it's based off of the Ontario government's fiscal year. So from uh, April 1st of 2022 to uh, March 31st of 2023, uh, Mill Sex OPP, we've received a grant uh, to hire another uh, mental health clinician. Uh, so we are going to have two clinicians working with us. Uh, one, and we're going to uh, come up with a formula once the clinician has been hired by Canadian Mental Health and see if that person is going to be dedicated to. Uh, the follow-ups, or if we're going to have two live uh, agents, uh, uh, clinicians out in the uh, county, out in the county working with us, uh, but just having the the additional uh, clinician with us is going to uh, just increase our, our service to the community, which at the end of the day is what we really want. So, uh, and I, and I only see these type of programs becoming bigger and uh, more robust throughout the uh, throughout the years to come, as the government's recognizing that's. Uh, Something had to be done, and it's it's slowly it's a slow pro, uh, process, but it's uh, we're heading in the right direction. Um, James, you got the the next slide, and then uh, so just a, a couple of future enhancements that uh, so one I just talked about was the additional uh, MSER crisis worker that we were have successfully been able to uh, to secure funding for for the for this one year via a grant, and with the success that these programs are having, I cannot see the government uh, either not making these full time or not having additional grants next year. It's to have something for one year that is gonna have a positive impact on our community and then for it to uh, disappear at the end of next fiscal. Personally, and this is obviously Dean Croker speaking, not, uh, not the OPP. I, I just can't see where the, uh, the government would be able to do that because uh, the, the success is gonna be there in our stats. We do have to report back to the uh, provincial government with the successes we're having. So I, I cannot see where this will not uh, equate into a full-time position uh, into the, uh, the coming years. Uh, Middlesex OPP has been identified in, uh, for a new detachment. Uh, so what's been going on over the last number of years is the, uh, the OPP with the Infrastructure Ontario is it's called Modernization Projects. And we're now entering into what, what's referred to as Mod 3 or Modernization Phase 3. The next batch of detachments across the province that are uh, slated for a uh, new building. Uh, I've been told that Middlesex is in the, the mod three category. I just don't know exactly where, how high up the list. Typically there's, uh, I think they look at 10 detachments is, is how that works out to them into, these, uh, uh, into these phases. Where we are, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and it is, it's a, it will likely be like it's a five to seven year uh, plan from the time that uh, the, the approvals received from gun, from the government for spending to the acquisition of uh, property and to, uh, to the actual completion. Uh, so five to seven years, unfortunately, I won't be around to see the new buildings, um, but I am putting, uh, making sure that my, my thoughts are shared. Uh, typically what's, what's happening with these modernization phases is the, uh, the OPP and the government wants to have uh, less buildings. So they're, uh, Huron County just recently went through, uh, they, they were in uh, modernization phase two and they received uh, one building for the entire detach, or sorry, the entire county of uh, Huron County. Uh, so the Exeter office was closed, uh, Godridge was closed and Wingham was closed and everything was amalgamated under one detachment. And there are definitely some benefits to that from a detachment perspective. All our assets are in one building. All our people are in one building. So information sharing and uh, you know just keeping track of our assets is much easier. Where right now I have four different work sites. Uh, however, I've put my uh, for what it's worth. I, I put my my thoughts on initially to so hopefully people will keep listening. Is that uh, as much as a detachment commander, I would like to have one building. It it really doesn't work because the uh, since the city of London is in the middle of our county, 
there is no ideal spot for one building to be for us to be able to quickly get to the uh, 400 series highways or to any of our communities. So I have suggested that we look at two buildings uh, and I've been asked where I thought uh, two buildings could go and I've, I have really no say in this, but I've just from a uh, logistical as aspect, I have suggested Millsec Centre and Lucan Badolf would be spots where, because in with Millsec Centre, we have the ability to get to the 402, 401 quickly. Uh, and then we can get to our Indigenous communities, we can get to uh, you know, Strathroy Park Hill, and then uh, Lucan also serves for the north end of the uh, uh, of our county and can also be a support to uh, Huron County as well, since they no longer have an attachment in Exeter. Uh, so that's, uh, that's don't uh, don't take that to the bank. Those are my uh, the thoughts that I put forward. Uh, but just with the uh, having one building, uh, and I guess if I was to say if there was likely one building, uh, it, it would be tough to you know. Availability of land and where it would go are, are factors that uh, you know government infrastructure Ontario will look at. But I'll I'll keep you posted as to when I find out where we are on this list and uh, yeah, and we can dis discuss this further at uh, at a future date. But as that's just the uh, something that's recently come to our attention, and I quickly just put my two cents into the uh, decision making process as to I think Middlesex would be better served with two detachments versus one. Uh, and then the last one, uh, staffing updates. Uh, right now, and there's uh, the review still going on. And I'd uh, I had reached out to Michael uh, back in it would have been early January, uh, just for some projections as to what the growth of Middlesex Center was going to be would look like in the uh, coming years. And uh, and I, I reached out to all our municipalities, and I, I do have to say. Uh, uh, Middlesex Center, you, you had a very, very robust and well-detailed plan, which is very helpful for me. Thank you. Uh, so I've uh, provided updates as to uh, our staffing needs for the future. And though the, the project is not done yet, it's been a review that's been on underway for about a year and a half now and uh, is expected to wrap up shortly. And when it is, I'm hoping for good news, which I'll definitely share. But I would suspect based off of the presentation I made, uh, based off of the growth of Middlesex County, uh, but with Middlesex Center being one of the uh, largest growth areas that we should, the Middlesex OPP, our complement of police officers should increase uh, uh, in the next uh, two to three years uh, based off. And the, the only delay with that is that how long it takes to actually train police officers at the uh, police colleges. There's a certain capacity that they can handle uh, and our needs are, uh, we'll, we will take up every seat that we can have at the uh, police college and it'll just be uh, uh, getting those bodies through the uh, the, the police training in the uh, coming years to uh, augment our, our staffing. So uh, once I know what the numbers are, I said, I, I definitely know we won't be losing numbers, uh, but I, I'm very, very confident that we will see an increase in uh, police officers for Middlesex County. So uh, again, being respectful of everybody's time, those are a few things I just wanted to uh, touch on. And again, I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. If there are any questions, I'll, uh, I'll stick around. Uh, thank you for that. I'll look to Council. Are there questions? I'll start with Councillor Cates. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, thank you for the uh, thank you for the update. Um, uh, nice to see some of those calls for service going uh, numbers going down. Um, one thing that I'm wondering if you can comment on. So when you you said about billable hours going down, which I'm not really asking about that scenario what I'm wondering about is uh and maybe a common question that you know others could have how does uh patrolling and radar fit into the scenario you, you know uh if billable hours are down does that mean you're not in our area or does that mean you spend more time patrolling around and putting putting up speed radars yeah no it's uh so when our when our billable so our billable hours are uh, are the hours that we put into investigations. Uh, so for for the assaults, the sexual assaults, for the break and enters. Uh, so when our billable hours in theory go down, then our availability for, for general patrol or proactive patrols go up. So uh, what should be happening, and we do have traffic initiatives all the time throughout the county. Uh, when our officers aren't tied up with investigations, 
the expectation is that they are doing their other core function, which is, you know, one is investigating crime, but then two is being proactive in our community. So with either just through general patrol or traffic enforcement, mm -hmm. that should be a, an increase. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Uh, Councillor Shipley, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Inspector Crocker. Uh, quick question, Dean. Um, stunt driving, has it gone up or gone down or has the effect of more uh, disciplinary action helped that at all? Councilor Shipley, I, I wish I could say it's going down. Um, I, I'm amazed at the amount of uh, vehicles that we're seizing, uh, just the, the repercussions of losing your vehicle for uh, uh, 14 days and being suspended for 30 days. Uh, it's it's a daily occurrence where we're having multiple uh, events uh, of that, and it's uh, uh, yeah, I and it, unfortunately, and it's uh, not to uh, paint a, a certain category in, uh, but it's young males are the ones when I see the reports coming out. It's uh, uh, young being obviously much younger than me, uh, but in the uh, the you know the teens and twenty early twenties, like uh, still an age group that should know better. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, so the uh, short answer is, uh, no, it's not going down and sadly it's going up and our, uh, our officer are busy with that as well. Just a follow up question, Madam Mayor. Um, do most of the, uh, I guess the people stop or does it end up in high speed pursuit? Um, well, I'm going to say, well, it's a good, I, I'm just trying to give you a, an accurate answer because there's two different things there. Um, we, uh, we do not pursue for speeders. Uh, so there, there is a provincial uh, legislation as to when we can legally pursue somebody. So uh, what does happen is that we will have people fail to stop and our officers are not in a position to, uh, uh, to pursue after them, but we still, uh, and I'd have to, to, to give you, an, I'd have to actually look into the number of failed stops. We've had to uh, give you a proper uh, correlation between the two. The, uh, however, though, we do have quite a few people that are stopping with the stunt drive because we're, we're, we're getting them. So, because we can't pursue them. So they, they are stopping and, uh, or we're using other methods to get them stopped before it would get into a pursuit. So. Yeah. All right. All right. I guess, then. Oh, sorry, oh, I guess, I guess if they're not stopping, there might be another reason they're not stopping other than the uh, yeah. speed. Yes, very true. Uh, oh, Councillor Arts, go ahead. Through your Madam Mayor to Dean, when it comes to mental health issues, I was always led to believe when the grass starts to green up that the, the rates for that increase, like over 12 months, is, is there a way to? Is there one time of the year that it's worse than others or is just an average? Uh, for, for Middlesex County, it's actually, it, it's, I, I'd say it's actually fairly steady throughout the year. We, where we may see some peaks and this is a, uh, there might be a slight peak at uh, Christmas time. Uh, that's a, that's a time when uh, it's, you know, for those that are not uh, surrounded by family uh, and the, because the, the other thing that uh, coincides with mental health is also addiction issues. Uh, the two go sometimes go hand in hand or their, or their mental health is not brought on by the addiction, but the uh, Christmas time is, is a, can be a sad time if you're not, if you don't have family. Um, what we've seen in through COVID uh, it, we didn't really have, like any peaks, it just seemed that it was a uh, constant throughout the whole 2020 uh, and 2021 didn't seem to really change. So it's, uh, uh, but I can definitely uh, get, what I can do is uh, I can report back through, I, I can send Michael some information that he could share uh, just to give you actually much more, I, I can easily pull up the analytics. I just, I'm going off memory, just off of the uh, every, Every day I get a shift briefing report from the officers and it just seems that our, our mental health calls are consistent on every every shift, but I, I'll report back and I'll give uh, Michael some information as to uh, when our peak times are and actually let you know when days of the week are, uh, all the information is easily uh, obtainable. I just don't have it uh, right with me. Thank you. I don't see any more hands. So, um, 
I'd like to say thank you, Dean. It was uh, particularly heartening to hear how well the program, the mental health, um, the mobile response, uh, crisis response team is operating and the efficiencies and effectiveness. It's, I think, great for members of the public who need help. Uh, it's obviously working as far as efficiency, effectiveness of utilization for your force. And as well uh, for the hospitals, the emergency rooms are always crammed yes. and, and to make sure you can lighten that load there is, is good news too. So um, it's great to hear too that you're expanding the manpower there and, and that will be available to uh, members of our, uh, to our residents and members of the public. So I just want to say thank you very much for all you're doing and we appreciate your time today. Uh, we'll look forward to the next update and, and thank you for your offer of help to send along some stats to our staff. We'll look forward to getting that. Absolutely. No, I'll work on it first thing this morning. Thanks very much. And uh, Michael, okay. thanks very much for the invitation. And James, thanks for organizing this for me. Okay, good to see you. You're, thanks for your worship. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, um, we have another um, uh, presentation coming up, and that would be from Ken Logtenberg. I hope I'm saying that correctly, from BM Ross & Associates. And the topic is um, the 2021 Structures Inspection Report, specifically Bridges and Culverts. And there you are. Good morning, Mr. Logan. Is am I saying it right, Logtenberg? Yep, that's that's good. Thank you. Okay, the floor is yours if you'd like to make your presentation. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to council today on this uh, topic. I'm going to switch the screen over to uh, my presentation, and then uh, I'll work my way through it. Um, it's kind of uh, I find it hard to maybe catch very many questions as we work our way through. So I'll probably have to get your questions at the end. Um, just, uh, Did you want me to jump in if there's a hand? Yeah, with that? yeah, if there's a question, if somebody wants a question during, just speak up or something and try to get my attention and then we'll try to okay. adjust it as we go. Okay, I'll keep watch too then. Okay, um, so you know, topics, your, your bridge needs assessment that was completed last year. And uh, first I'll go through a little bit of the scope of the presentation. So. Uh, first, we'll talk about the scope of the assessment, uh, explain some of the inspection methods that uh, are implemented in those two parts. I'll probably go through them fairly quick, and then I'll get into more of the other stuff, which is a summary of some of the observations that we had, uh, description of the improvement types that and things that were identified. There's some maintenance type improvements and capital improvements that are proposed. Uh, then we'll go through an illustration of a few examples concluding comments and then opportunity for some additional questions at the end. So the uh, scope of the assessment, um, basically we create, create a map of all the structure locations, uh, review the information from, from previous bridge inspection reports. Within your municipality, we had uh, two more bridges added and 19 culverts added this past year that were identified that maybe had not been identified in the past. Uh, there's five additional ones that were found much later and they're going to be reviewed this spring and we'll provide that updated information to staff. The um, visual inspections of all the structures, they're assembled on the OSIM forms. And the OSIM form stands for Ontario Structure Inspection Manual and it's something the province had prepared for municipalities help to keep this information in sort of a standardized format instead of a lot of different formats. Um, then we review and analyze the results, develop some general observations, prioritize a list of needs, assign timelines, calculate probable costs for the repair and maintenance work, and um, prepare a report and present the results. The, there's Ontario legislation that's required that basically says that all bridges are to be inspected under the supervision of a professional engineer every two years. And these inspections are carried out, like I said, in general accordance with that OSIM manual. Uh, the definition of a bridge is any structure with spans greater than three meters. So sometimes they're culverts, sometimes they're, they're in a shape, in the form of a bridge, but if they have a span greater than three meters, they fit under this category. The uh, bridge assessment method. So the bridges, they're inspected as per the manual and, and the, those, some of those tasks that are included in the manual our recording of measurements, taking photos of major components, identifying defects, and then we assign condition rating to the components. And those are based on a visual observations and non-destructive testing. So we're not, we're not taking material samples off the bridge. We're just uh, 
doing visual and sometimes we'll do a non-destructive such as using a hammer for sounding or other methods to try to check for soundness. Then we calculate a bridge condition index score and uh, they, it's, they usually call it a BCI for short. We uh, identify timelines for the repairs based on the opinion of the engineer. Then those are either in the urgent, uh, less than one year, one to five year, and six to 10. That's typically what's required in the OSIM, but as requested by the municipality, we've added another category for some uh, suggestions of needs that would probably come up in the 11 to 20 year period. Uh, we may identify some needs for additional investigation. For example, it might be underwater investigation or um, we might uh, want to do some deck condition survey, which is uh, another method, but that's another thing that may be identified through the course of our inspections. Uh, then we calculate probable costs to address the needs. And at the completion, um, as requested by the municipality, we provide a prioritize the needs. And when we do it, we usually use the scoring system that we've developed and incorporate the opinion of the engineer to help create that priority list. This, this figure just gives a little bit of an illustration of this scoring system we use. And um, there's, there's kind of three components we think about when we try to prioritize the bridge needs. One being your condition rating or your probability of failure. So we'll give it a score based on that BCI score that we explained a little earlier. So there'll be a score of one to five. Then we look at the consequence of failure. The consequence of failure, it takes into account things like how, how much traffic is on that road or how important that road is. So again, we'll give it a score at a one to five. And then performance grade, those are components that are, you know, is the bridge, does it have a load limit on it? Is it a narrow bridge? Is there some other issues with the bridge? Sometimes it's poor drainage on the uh, bridge deck or something like that, that could be represent maybe a safety or another concern. We usually think we assign scores for each of these, combine the scores, and it's just a way we kind of think about how we want to prioritize the bridge. But fortunately, that the scoring system doesn't take into account some other factors, and that's why the engineering judgment has to kind of come in. There's um, things like preventative maintenance, and um, then there's safety needs that maybe overwhelming safety needs that have to be addressed, and so. We end up, we do this scoring, but we also have to implement engineering judgment and we adjust the priorities to, to what we think is appropriate for uh, your municipality. This scoring, this is just explaining a little bit of a table that's in the report, which explains, for example, consequence of failure. We have your different traffic ranges and we apply scores appropriately. And some of the factors we're taking into consideration, such as the width, width of the bridge or the width of the culvert and uh, load limits, if there's a load limit applied to the bridge. Um, the probability failure, that's your BCI score. And we've got the different ranges there and where the scores would be assigned. So basically it's a simplified scoring just to help, help prioritize a little bit. Um, and we also have uh, implement engineering judgment and the theoretical scores, the scores, they can only be really used as a guide and other factors have to be incorporated while we're prioritizing. So I'm gonna go in now to talk about some of the observations that we had from our, from our assessment. What we've done here is we've put in, prepared this figure, which shows the age distribution of the bridges. And some of the older bridges, in reality, we just had to guess how old they were because there's no records of when they were built. So we've had to guess with some of those. But you'll notice when you look at your age distribution, you've got a you, you got a decent number up at the here, but you've got most of your bridges were built in the 60s and 70s. And uh, just looking at the statistics, you know we've got 51 bridges and 75 culverts that were reviewed. Five of the structures are older than 80 years old, and 22 of the structures are less than 25 years old. The average age is 46. Now. We've included some comments up here on life expectancy and um, the, the bridge code says you're supposed to design a bridge to last 75 years. But in our opinion, most 
structures last a little longer than that. And we've, we've often thought, well, maybe we should use 80 as a typical life expectancy for the bridges. But there's, you know, it varies an awful lot. And trying to come up with an expectation is kind of a tricky thing to do because it depends on how well you maintain your bridges and other factors. Um, with corrugated steel pipes, we know they, they have a shorter life. So that's just uh, an FYI, and I may talk about that a little more after a couple more slides. The next, this next slide, this shows uh, the BCI, which is your condition rating for the bridges. And when you look at that, you'll notice you've got, I want just, just to understand the scoring system, starts out with 100 being a bridge in excellent condition, and 40 is considered a bridge in poor condition that when you get to that point, it's a structure that you sh usually you consider whether you're gonna have to replace it or you should be repairing it, is, is just a general rule of thumb, but that's uh, not, a, you know, not a definitive, it's just a general rule. But if we think of it that way, which you look at your structures, you've got you know you got a decent number up here. Those are probably the newest structures. They're up close to 100, and you've got a bunch in this 60 to 80 range. And then you've got a few other ones that are down below that. But the there's 10 structures with BCI scores that were under 40, and your average BCI score was 65. So, but the next slide. What we've done is we've tried to put the BCI scores and the age scores together. And the thinking is to try to see how well your bridges are performing compared to their age. And what we tried to do is we tried to line it up so that a bridge would go from a score of 100 down to 40 over about an 80 year period. So we're trying to, we're assuming, let's say, if 80 years is appropriate life, then these bar charts should line up to be fairly similar. But when you look at them, you'll notice, well, pretty close here, we've got more in this range in terms of their condition rating and more over here in terms of their age. Um, then you've got a couple that go the other way. But just looking at it, I'm, there's a possibility you might be performing a little better than 80 year life. But one thing that makes it difficult to simply try to compare these two and say, yeah, we know for sure what's going on is the fact that every time you do a rehabilitation to a bridge, the condition rating will jump back up. So a bridge will start out with a score of 100, it'll start to deteriorate, but then when it's repaired, the score will jump back up, maybe back up to 90 or something like that, close to a, a brand new condition. So that makes it a little difficult to try to apply these two beside each other. So I'll just jump ahead to the next slide. Okay, so some of the things we've, um, we broke down the needs. There's some that we define as maintenance tasks and some of them are sort of more like a capital works type of a task. The maintenance tasks, they include things such as cleaning the bearing seats to let water get away from the bridge, the girders. And the girders are your structural elements that help to support the deck. And it, if the water lingers around the girders too long, it can cause damage to the girders and they're more expensive elements than other components on the bridge. So you wanna try to keep that water from getting down and in around the girders. Um, pressure washing off expansion joints and seals and checking for leaks, cleaning gravel off of the curbs and the deck. It's just if that material lingers and stays on top of the deck and on the curbs, the, the, they will stay damp and the concrete sort of deteriorates more quickly over time. Um, resealing joints in the walls with caulking, removing brush and logs that block the culverts, um, restore eroded stream banks and placing riprap at the toe, uh, regrading the shoulders so that the water can uniformly spread, go off the side of the road instead of uh, potentially becoming a washout that's in one localized location. That's, that's the, uh, the typical maintenance tasks. And what we've done is we've prepared a list. We've got the structure location and some identified maintenance tasks. Now we've assigned some costs to them. Um, however, some of these 
some of these we intend or most of these we anticipate municipal staff may be able to address and so those costs are you know if your municipal staff do them it's a lot different than maybe hiring a contractor to do them but we've included costs in them some of them are replacing riprap which might be something that maybe is a little too more maybe your staff are not uh, comfortable doing that and you may have to get permits to do some of the work in the water but we've provided the list and i think we've got two pages worth of maintenance things that were identified and and implementation of those maintenance tasks will usually help to extend the life of the bridges and culverts so now i'm going to talk more about sort of capital improvement needs and uh some culverts they appear structurally sound but replacement has been proposed because they're quite narrow and uh, you know a wider culvert will provide safer passage for vehicles over top and they'll be better they're able to accommodate agricultural equipment uh, there was numerous bridges we identified that may have some leaking expansion joints in the desk deck ends and we're recommending repairs to prevent deterioration of the girders at the abutments at the bearing seats uh, there's some bridges where there's deck drains that are short and their or their ends of the drains have corroded off and this leads to deterioration of the girder members and the, the deck soffit and um, so with something like that you can install extensions or, or sleeve the drains to help let the water pass through so it's not coming in contact with the soffit of the bridge um, we're generally with yours, after we reviewed it, we found that we're generally recommending a lot of repairs to your bridge to preserve and maintain the bridge components extend and extend the life of the bridge versus replacement for your larger bridges. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, a combination of engineering judgments, uh, sort of some of the timelines that were identified on the OSIM reports and the theoretical scoring, they're used to help prioritize your capital improvement needs. So needs to address structural safety concerns and preventative maintenance work, they are prioritized. Uh, sometimes other options are chosen, such as doing temporary repairs to delay you know, replacement work, for example. And in some cases, we may be, um, there may be a suggestion or discussion about the idea of doing nothing and eventually closing the bridge. But in your municipality, I don't know if we had any of those with yours and I've seen it in some municipalities this is something they're considering for some of their roads that are not very well not used very much but i don't think we were discussing any of that with your structures um and and lastly the probable cost and assumed repair and replacement needs they're calculated based on 2021 cost so you'll just have to inflate those as required going forward uh, the next few slides i think we have some tables of the needs that were identified um, a few of these structures, you'll see them a little later with our examples that we have to illustrate some of the repairs. Um, like this B124, we had a, the budget estimates are provided. Um, and in addition, the municipality asked us to provide some indication of what EA requirements would be required by the structure. So we've included that information in the tables here and in the reports. The BCI scores are provided here. And we've included some suggested years for when to do the work. But those are subject to, you know, staff's comment and council's and budget availability. But we are asked to provide a suggested year for when to do the work the work. Um, so this is another page of work for the one to five year period. And if you go down over that five year period, we'd identify about $6 million worth of work, um, which works out to over a million dollars per year, which is a fairly substantial number. So there may be desires or needs to adjust some of that work. And, and that's something that uh, could be discussed with the municipality. They can make a decision in that regard if they have to delay some work that might be possible. Um, okay, and uh, sometimes there's, We've tried to group things sometimes. If there's structures that have similar needs that can be grouped together, it might be a way to reduce your costs. So for example, I just noticed here, we got a bunch of them with guide rail. So we put them in the same year and it might be something that they might group together as a one project if there's just some guide rail needs. 
this next table shows some some repair needs identified in the six to 10 year period. And you'll notice this number is quite a bit lower than in the one to five. Therefore, I wouldn't be surprised if some of your work in the one to the five ends up getting pushed out into the six to 10 year period. But, uh, and the average cost per year in that time period was only 700,000. And the next slide, there's some work in the 11 to 20. And again, this is, a, this is a lower number again over that time period. But what may happen, future inspections may identify some other needs that were not identified at this time. And uh, so there may be some other, other repair needs that come up in the future. So I was gonna go through a few examples here just to talk about some of the specifics on the structures. Um, this one is a B124 on 10 Mile Road. And it was proposed that they replace the superstructure. You have girders that are, as you can see in this one photo, there's longitudinal cracks that are developing within the girder members. Um, there's some repair needs on the abutments, but most of the abutments are sound. So the plan was to replace the superstructure, waterproof and pave the deck to help preserve the condition of the deck and patch repair some of the abutments. Um, that's with, the, with that structure, that was a list of the main things. There'll be other miscellaneous work that will have to take place at the same time. The next structure I'm illustrating here, this is a B120 on Vanek Road. And this one, I've, I've identified that there's some, it's more minor work on this one, but repairs to some of the the joints through the curbs. Um, you have the deck drains. This is an example that shows, I don't know if you, I think you can see my arrow. Um, the deck drains just barely get to the bottom of the girders. So then the water runs around and it causes damage to the bottom of those girders in that area. And over time, it'll deteriorate your girder. So the, while doing this work, you should extend those deck drains a little bit down below the soffit. And upgrades are some, the guide rails. This buried end treatment is not a, current standard and it's suggested to do some upgrades when you're doing work on the bridge to do upgrades to the guide rail. This uh, is an illustration of one of the corrugated steel pipe culverts that's uh, we're recommending for replacement. You've got large perforations in, uh, in, in the pipe and you've got other places where the bottom is bent upwards and we're recommending replacement of this structure. Uh, road crews, we've suggested to be aware of the structure and kind of monitor in case there happens to be a road settlement. Um, it's, there is, doesn't appear to be evidence of it right at this time, but there's potential for the culvert to kind of push in at the bottom and some settlement to take place. And that's an early warning sign that you have to maybe, maybe have to close the road. So it's something to monitor, I guess, by road crews. And, uh, with this structure, this is B146 on 16 Mile Road. Similar to the one we talked about earlier, you've got the girders, moisture has been getting down here, causing the girders to deteriorate. And, uh, and there's some further leaking at the ends, at the abutments at the end, they're leaking down through the joints at the end of the bridge deck. So we're recommending a replacement of the bridge deck. There's quite a few of these little issues with the girders. Um, the railings, the rust is fairly bad, so we're recommending to replace the railings while you're doing that work. And, um, and, and basically we're proposing replacement of that superstructure, which is the top portion of the bridge, basically the bridge deck. Underneath. This one, and I think the next one, are one of these culverts that hadn't been inspected in the past, and they were identified that we should take a look at them. And as you can see, they're fairly, this is a fairly old structure and it's in, it's in poor condition and we're recommending a replacement for this culvert. Um, it's, I guess the roadway is paved, it's fairly narrow. So be an opportunity to maybe make the culvert a little longer. So you don't have to have the guide rails right besides the road on this structure. And that's on 13 mile road. Uh, this is another one, a fairly old culvert you can see underneath that the rebar is rusting and concrete's falling off. So it's in, it's in poor condition. And again, we're recommending a replacement for this structure. 
and probably you would do some sort of an extension to make it a little longer so you've got a little bit more shoulder room going over the over top of the culvert. So my concluding comments, we're proposing a combination of culvert replacements and bridge repairs and there's maintenance type work to help preserve the integrity of the bridges. No large bridge replacements are, are proposed at this time within the next 20 years, but that's, that's assuming you do some of the repairs to the bridge decks and that'll help extend the life of the bridges. We had $6 million of needs identified to be completed within the next five years. Then 3.6 million of needs for the following that six to 10 year period and $2.7 million needs were identified that are anticipated will be needed in the 10 to 20 year period. Uh, about 249,000 of maintenance needs, but again, that depends on whether your staff do a lot of that work or not. Follow-up inspections are required every two years as per the provincial, legis or provincial um, legislation with regards to bridge inspections. So, now it's an opportunity for questions. If um, I'll open that up, if somebody had any questions for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll start with you, Councillor Arts. Through your Madam Mayor to Ken, I'm not too sure if you can answer this question, but when it comes to either replacing or fixing or rehabilitating concrete bridges, like we're farmers and you know, there's some important bridges that we use every day. And six months go by, eight months go by, 12 months go by. Uh, there was a while ago they were doing some in the 402. I think it took more than 12 months and they disappeared for two months. Like, I don't understand why it takes so long. If you're going to fix a bridge, go at it and get it done. I realize concrete's got a cure, but I guess my question is, or my beef is, why does it take so long? Um. I think some of it is municipalities, when they put some of them out to tender, they find if they, like you can specify, we want a tighter timeline for construction. And there are some options to make tighter timelines. And there are some options where they use precast components to help reduce the duration of the construction period. But I think part of it is also they're looking at it and they're putting these jobs out to tender. The contractors have, I would say, a decent number of jobs to bid on. So they're looking at them and saying, okay, oh, this one's got a tight timeline. I've got other commitments. I can't commit all my forces to that. So you end up paying quite a premium if you make it a real tight timeline for the contractor to do the work. Whereas if you are able to accommodate them, give them a little more time for construction and they can move back and forth with their crews between two or three different projects, they get a little bit more competitive pricing for the contractors to do the work. And then it comes down to the municipality or the owner of the bridge to decide, okay, which, what's our priority? Is it, we have to get it done real fast or, or we want to reduce cost for getting the work done. I, I think that's part of the factor of what happens with some of those bridges when they, they give them enough of a timeline to do the work. They're doing that to help keep the construction costs from getting too high. Thank you. Other questions? Councillor Cates. Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, to Ken. I just wanted to say that, you know, I appreciate the information and the timelines, um, you know, and the attention to detail. I lived in Nova Scotia for a couple of years, and uh, it was very common for bridges to collapse. You'd see on the, uh, there's another one, and a dump truck going over the bridge and the bridge collapsed. There was, I would drive like a half an hour to avoid a road that oh, had that bridge. So I appreciate the information. Uh, Councillor Shipley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> uh, to Ken, just wondering, Ken, when do you decide in a culvert to shove a liner in it? And as, as opposed to replacing the culvert, just, uh, put a liner through it. Okay, so there's there's a couple, well, maybe point out one thing. With doing a liner, you're gonna reduce the hydraulic capacity of the structure. So there's sometimes you do a hydraulic analysis and you determine whether that's something that would be acceptable or if it's gonna cause flooding over the road too frequently. So that's, that's one option you have to think about. Um, the other thing is we found that liners are 
cost effective if you have a culvert that's got a lot of fill on it. If it's, you know, way down the bottom under a great big mound of dirt, and the contractor's going to be digging for, you know, four or five days before he even gets down to the culvert, then it's often, then, then you want to consider the possibility of using a liner. But if, if there's not a lot of cover over top of the culvert, it's often just as cost effective to rip it out and put a new one in versus trying to put a liner in. So um, those are a couple of the factors. Um, there's timing and there's how important that road is. If the road's gonna be, you know, there's some roads that you don't wanna close down. We had one, we put a liner in and then we did a jack and bore and put a second culvert in beside because we had to maintain the same hydraulic capacity, but they didn't wanna close the road. So they did put a liner in, but then they jack and board beside it. So the cost for that project was, it might've been cheaper to, or probably would've been cheaper just to replace it, even though they had to dig down a ways, but they did not want to close that road. They thought it was so important of a route that they were willing to pay the extra cost. So those are, those are some of the factors anyways. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Well, I don't see any more hand. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan. I'm just wondering, what is the span that you can use on a box culvert versus building a bridge over a water course? Like how wide of a, a span can you go with a box culvert versus a, a, a span bridge over it? So the general rule is uh, 6.1 meters, which is 20 feet. Um, that doesn't mean we haven't done a couple projects where you do a cast in place and you build a box culvert that is a larger span, but traditionally 6.1 meters is, is kind of the, the maximum. And, and beyond that, you're doing something outside of the ordinary. And, and in most situations, that's the way you would try to go. And, and the reason being they, they typically last longer. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, they're usually a little more cost effective, but not, not always there's there are some circumstances where we put in bridges that are just as cost effective so okay but. is there anyone else i don't see any hands so um i'll just say uh thank you mr lochtenberg um there's a lot of information and work that goes into um providing a report like this, but I think it's, um, council will certainly appreciate the fact that we can see how this helps identify work priorities and how it's tied to budgeting and, and extending the life of our apps, assets and so forth. So, um, and clearly it's obviously important too, when you look at the summary charts, there are a lot of zeros after those numbers. So um, these are important decisions to have uh, well-informed. So uh, thank you for your time and your patience with questions and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Yep, you're very welcome. Thank you. Very well then, we can now move to the adoption of the minutes. Uh, the first motion before us is that the minutes of March 16th, uh, the meeting A, be adopted as printed. Uh, if I could have a mover please, and a seconder, Councillor Cates and Councillor Heffernan. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, then uh, the minutes for the March 16th second meeting, that is B, um, the motion before us is that the minutes of that meeting be adopted as printed as well. Could I have another mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Scott and, uh, oh, you went down. Okay, Councillor Heffernan got you. Thank you. Um, any opposed to that? Seeing none, we can now move on to the consent agenda then. Uh, these are the items that are listed and received in one motion. Of course, council members may request that one or more item be removed for further action. Um, before I ask that the items um, be adopted as recommended, is there anything anyone wants to raise or ask or have? Okay, we have Councillor Heffernan, go ahead. Hello, um, I just, through the mayor, I just wanted to check with Tiffany on item number five the 2022 annual repayment limit. And it looks like with the new commitments, we are going to be at 14.31% and 17% is our um, in-house limit. So I guess, Tiffany, um, I'm concerned that we're getting close for one thing, and I'm, I know you are too. Um, but secondly, 
the Garden Ave storm sewer re, um, replacement, is that included in that 14.31? Uh, so through Mayor DeVeet, uh, yeah, so the higher amount does include anything that was approved as part of the 2022 budget um, and going forward. So I wanted to give a clear picture of what we're committed to um, in the future uh, with those capital projects. Because uh, as of right now, when you're looking at the annual repayment limit as calculated by the ministry, it is quite low. Uh, so we do have uh, quite a bit of room, but we do have um, multiple projects coming up in the next few years that will be debt financed. And so those have all been included in that report. Okay, thank you. And then I, I guess, just, I, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Kessler. Uh, I have a, a couple of more questions. Um, oh, wait, before we move on, is, mm -hmm. is and anyone wanting to ask anything about this item? Okay, I don't see any hands. So go ahead, Councillor, move to your next item then and we'll take that one next. Okay, I was, this is probably for Rob or Andrew. Um, the Execulink Telecom um, Municipal Access Agreement. So this is just a question. Um, so is has Rogers already put their their uh, flags out? Like we see a lot of flags out. Some were removed for April first, April Fool's Day, and had to be reinstalled. Um, so which one is out right now? Is it Rogers or Execulink? Uh, so good morning. Uh, so through Madam Mayor, Councillor Heffernan. So I apologize. I didn't miss the first part of that question as I was being brought on as panelists, but I. If you're just asking about the flags that are in Illiton, those are for uh, Rogers uh, extension of servicing. Oh, okay, okay. Yep. So ExecuLink will be doing the same thing. So ExecuLink doesn't have any current plans submitted, uh, but we proactively reached out to them to try to get a, uh, a municipal uh, access agreement in place like we're doing with some other tel telecoms as well. Okay, thanks a lot, Rob. That's it. Does anyone else have questions on other items? Uh, I'll start with Councillor, um, oh, I just bounced around. There you are, Councillor Scott, and then I think Councillor Skates had her hand, Cakes had her hand up as well. Okay, go ahead, Brad. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, this will be on the guard now uh, and to Rob, see if I can ask a couple of questions there. So uh, I see the recommendations to go ahead. In one of your in number four, I think on some of the options you mentioned something about the possibility of sanitary sewers in the future. So, are, so would any of this be interfered, or is there ways of going around it or over it? You know what I mean? If, if it's, I'm assuming that's going down to the river, right? So it's going to go down uh, Wellington Road, across York Street and Gideon, correct? That, that's correct. That's right. Yeah. So I guess my question is, is if, if, if we do a plan for sanitary series, of course we don't know where they might go, <clears throat> would it be deeper than that or over top or is that something that's kind of been looked at? I know some of these projects we can't wait because that could be. Yeah, so, that, so that's the issue is that we, we don't have a preliminary design for the installation of gravity sewers throughout the existing roads of Delaware, right? So we really don't know. So. A standard standard depth is, is eight feet for a sanitary sewer, but it's not uncommon to have them deeper depending on where you're trying to pick up gravity flow from. Um, so it, it will be deeper than the water main that's going in. Uh, it may or may not be deeper than the storm sewer that's going in. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm curious about. I know that's a tough question when you don't know, like I said, we don't know the path yet, but yeah. I guess it would be a matter of dealing with it when the time comes, right? Whether you yeah, yeah, that, that that's that's correct, and we don't know, um, you know, what what the staging of implementation would look like through Delaware, right? This this could be one of the last streets, and, and that's just, you know, so so yes, we we could wait, but we may be waiting a very long time if we wait for the sanitary, right? Yeah. Because we're not going to go in and tear up roads um, proactively. We'll wait until there's a, a a reason to go in and start replacing multiple services within a roadway, probably, and bring sanitary in. Like it's. We'll, we'll try to be efficient on how it gets brought into the existing neighborhoods, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what I was in my mind thinking that uh, if sanitaries come in, they could be somewhat uh, solely purpose to take care of new development rather than existing at this time. Right. Uh, which would mean if it ended up coming down Gideon, then you might run into that storm sewer there or at York Street, depending on the path that they might suggest, right? Uh, so, yeah. 
Yep. So w- during the design, we'd be looking at all the uh, elevations of existing pipes, right? To yeah, to, to avoid yeah. that in the design. Yeah. Yeah. So that you could further, if if something happened later in Delaware, we could further uh, maybe have the old part of Delaware join if if things got in trouble in the future. But initially, that would be our intent, probably. Right. Yeah. No. That's right. Yeah. So if you're talking Gideon, you're probably thinking initially of a force main, right? So a force main wouldn't run as deep. Uh, and it has flexibility to, it, it, it's not a gravity pipe, right? So it runs more like a water main, it's pressurized, so. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, perfect, thanks, Rob. Okay, and Councillor Cates. Madam Mayor to Rob, hi. Um, so I have a, a couple of questions, clarification for the Garden Ave uh, as well, um, you know, 3.6 million. Um, so um, the increase of 850,000. So I just want to clarify. So one, we had to stop, uh, I guess, early 2019 because of the species at risk. So now we skip ahead. We've got 850,000. So is a portion of this must be from obviously increases, et cetera. But because we stopped, because uh, of the species at risk. And then we have, well, wait a minute, let's do this at the same time and this at the same time. So that's why we have the 850,000. It's not just an increase, it's adding some things to it is how I'm. That, that's right. So part of it is increase in, in scope, particularly the replacement of the water main. And then part of it is the, the, the cost increases that we've seen during, during COVID, right? That's, yeah. Okay, so then my other question is, in looking at the recommendation that were recommendation that it be awarded to JR uh, and that the capital budget, uh, but then when you read the report, it says based on the available information, staff are of the opinion there are three options. So uh, which option did you pick? So the, the, the recommended option is option one, right? Okay. To, to proceed with the full scope uh, to JR. Uh, but we laid out one to lay out, and sorry, it's actually four four options that were that we saw as as the potential ways forward, right? Okay, but you you are actually going with, and maybe maybe it says yeah. that, and I missed it, but I just wanted to clarify. So yeah, so and, yeah, and just to comment, um, I see the value in past history uh, work skills. If that's not the right way to say it, but for between the two companies. Thank you. Thank you. I see Councillor Shipley's hand. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, to Michael, on the phase one renovation of the office, I see you're putting an addition onto the community center. So is the community center going to be in between offices then? Is that the way that's going to work? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Shipley. Uh, this is an exciting project for us. Uh, we are just on the, on the uh, verge of getting this underway. Uh, we're working around that. We're preserving the community center here in Coldstream. And the addition will be um, from the uh, one side of the building out towards the parking lot. And so we're working around uh, the southerly and uh, west uh, easterly uh, edges of the building. Okay, I was just concerned if it was to the south, I guess I got to walk through the community center then, but no, if it's going that way, then it'll, okay, that's, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, um, I did. I did want to ask um, the public works and engineering staff a question about 7.2. Um, it's kind of general though. I guess I could take it offline. Is Rob gone? Um, the chair, we uh, have Rob and Andrew joining us uh, here momentarily. Okay. Thank you. This is, um, thank you. Thank you for coming back, Rob. I just wanted to ask a question about 7.2, which is the report that we just had a presentation on. Um, I wondered if you could just make some general comments about the impacts of this detail then on your um, plans and integration with the asset management plan. Um, When I saw that we were missing items, I presume now they're on the asset management plan. We know what our assets are. Um, Can you just make some general comments and maybe um, talk about how they're integrated and how you use that then to get you through to the next two years when you probably have to make more changes again? Yeah, so, so thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, so general comments, so I would say it came as a bit of a surprise to find that many additional structures out there and obviously has 
uh, significant longer term impact, right? They're not all huge ones, but they are over the three meters. So I wouldn't, so we now have them in our asset list. I wouldn't say we have them integrated yet, but that'll be the next step is to integrate them and to look at the financial impact of adding those. So when when we run the uh, predictor model again that had been done previously with Watson's and we look at the long-term funding, um, those will be incorporated in, right? And I mean, the process will be no different from this cycle to the next two-year cycle. We'll be looking at the, the conditions of them again, uh, of all the structures and then kind of reevaluating where the priorities are the inclusion of these structures now may shift some of the priorities that have been identified previously, right? Um, if we look at our spending and, and maybe some of these will, will move to the one to five year list and some of the others will have to shift off a little bit. So we will review that. Um, it's, uh, it, it's again, it's going to, we'll update the financial model. So when we look at assessments and, you know, tax levies and whether or not we have to, how, how much we have to grow that to be able to uh, compensate or for our funding long-term. So is that, that's pretty high level, but I'm not sure if you have any more specific details you want or. No, no, I just wanted to make sure that I was on the right track and that yeah. um, I, it's an integrated approach we have and all the new information is being fed in and the numbers will roll through right through to the accounting department and we'll see that in our budget. Uh, absolutely. And this is only, I mean, these are, uh, you know, I'd say a fairly significant or major change, but we also have other assets that are, you know, would be the non-core assets that we're working on integrating with smaller culverts. Uh, we've captured a number of those that we were developing the inventory. Ultimately, we'll end up building them into the asset management and bring those into the financial plans as well. So, yeah. And that weighted average that he's using between this condition and, and like all of the adding together the age and the, the, the ranking that they have. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could have a surprise. Uh, I guess something could deteriorate more quickly because of weather or something. And, and here we are. We'll yeah. have to test for that, too. And, and that's where having the regular reviews every two years, we'll, we'll be able to see if there's a, if some are deteriorating faster than others, right? And then plan plan accordingly. And maybe the, the life life cycle uh, or expectancy of some structures will drop to 70 and maybe someone will go to 85, right? As we monitor, the, have good data, the better our data gets, then the better we can forecast, so. Yeah. Well, perfect, well done. It's always good, good to get this update. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, then we have a motion before us that item 7.1 through 7.10 listed under the heading of consent agenda um, for April 6, 2022 be adopted as recommended. Uh, do I have our mover, please? Uh, Councillor Shipley and Councillor Cates. Any, anyone opposed? Seeing done, that, that is carried. We can move on now to our staff reports. Uh, item number one is the declaration of surplus property with respect to the Kamoka Community Centre. And our CAO, Michael, will provide an overview of this report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through the chair to council, earlier this year, council received a presentation from Dr. Chris Chant. The presentation was in regards to exploring a future, a unique venture and requiring property to do so. Staff reached out to Dr. Chant following the presentation to learn more about the project. As we began to study the project, it was evident that creating a public-private partnership would be a great benefit to our municipality, and in particular, the community of Ward 4, Kilworth, Kamoka. We identified the Kamoka Community Centre as an ideal location for a few reasons. Namely, the building is in excess of 40 years old and is starting to require expensive major upgrades. The capital funds needed over the next five years alone will be in excess of $600,000, and that's just on the building itself. Even prior to COVID-19, the community centre was underused and not profitable, operating at a loss year over year. One single tenant provides the bulk of the revenues received, which poses a financial risk to the municipality should they move to using a different facility. There is an opportunity to make better use of the nearby Kamoka Wellness Center and see concentration of activity there in the future, especially with the Unity Square project about to take shape in the next few years. The overall footprint of the new building would ensure that the municipality would maintain control of the 20 plus acres of property as park and green space. Further, the partnership would provide new and upgraded sport facilities at no cost to the taxpayer and the sale of the property would generate a sizable reserve fund that would allow for community projects in the Kamoka Kilworth area for years to come. These are just some of the reasons as outlined and to elaborate on the staff report that's before you. 
I would note that, this, that municipal staff met with the leadership of local community groups uh, that use the Kamoka Community so Center property, including the Kamoka Railway Museum, Gateway Church, the Optimist Club, and 55 plus group, to name a few, to discuss this concept and proposal. While there are many economic and recreational benefits to this proposal, we have received feedback from residents over the last few days. That passion is welcomed and appreciated. It shows staff that there is still more work to be done before proposing such an important recommendation before council. That said, at this time, we are asking to defer any decision to declare the property surplus so that the area residents, public, council, and staff can ensure that we can provide the best information to move ahead or not. Earlier, I referenced that this is a public-private partnership opportunity. This isn't the first time the municipality has been approached for property, including this site. However, what made this report come forward is about the many positives, not just about the proceeds uh, of, the, of the building. Um, there's an opportunity to build our community, provide new or updated amenities, often and, um, and offer more locally available ice time as we have proven that the Wellness Center is at capacity and bringing a state-of-the-art health services closer to name a few. Seeing that there is more work to be done, a deferral in this project will enable staff to provide more information to residents in reviewing many comments. We will do our utmost to respond, followed by a special meeting dedicated to this important decision. I do want to thank the clerk's office for acknowledging and having all the correspondence uh, listed on your agenda for today. Uh, members of council, I am happy to take any questions. I do have Scott Mears with me, who's uh, been instrumental in helping me with this uh, important report that's before you. And as I su suggest, um, in lieu of the recommendation to declare, um, providing more time to digest this, perhaps having Dr. Chant come and attend, uh, I'm more than happy to change the recommendation to defer it to a special meeting. Uh, so that we can, uh, you know, recollect our thoughts and move ahead. I'm happy to take any questions, Council. Thank you for that report. Um, I'll look to Council then for questions. Uh, Councillor Cates. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so I appreciate the deferral. Um, I had a my speech, uh, call it my speech written, um, that I have shared already with council and staff, and I uh, posted it. And so I'm just wondering if I should, if I should be reading it so as that it could become part of this uh, meeting, um, the, the recording of this meeting. Um, is this the time that you'd like me to do that, or do we want to have questions first? Well, we have we have a, a presentation. I think oh, the questions I, okay. the questions uh, should be asked and answered, and we have a, a revised motion before us. So um, I think the questions are the first item to That's deal. That's what with. I wondered if we're at questions. Thank you. Okay. So again, are there questions on the presentation or clarifications? Uh, that are required of either the CAO or, or the Director of Community Services. Uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan. To you, Madam Mayor, to Michael. Uh, Michael, is there any indication that by deferring this uh, will jeopardize the, um, the uh, Dr. Chance proposal, like, it, it, is there any chance that this could, you know, he could back out and say, no, you're not interested, I'm going to go somewhere else, or is there any indication of that, do you know? Uh, through the chair to the deputy mayor, uh, staff have had dialogue with Dr. Chant, uh, and he is aware that this recommendation, this change in recommendation is being put forward this morning, and he is um, acceptable of this. Because uh, he feels that as being a community partner, he wants to ensure that we're doing our utmost together to address uh, the many comments that have come in. Add on. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? No. Uh, okay. Councillor Scott, I see your hand. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to check. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Not really. <laughs> it's hard to hear you today, Brad. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I got booted out here on the internet, so I'm assuming it's my connection. I'm just going to go off the headphones and try the speaker if that's any. Is that better now? I think so. Yeah. Okay. I'm just <laughs> not using the headphones. Sorry, not to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure you could hear me because I know I so got a message that you were hearing me well. So uh, uh, anyway, Madam Mayor, through you to Michael. Uh, thanks. I think the deferral probably at this time is uh, a good choice. Uh, and seeing everybody that's interested in, uh, in the community center is great. I think it's refreshing to get some, some feedback because it certainly makes all of our jobs a little bit easier. Um, but I think it also makes us recognize that, you know, as a community, if we do seriously I want to keep this Kamoka Community Center, then we also understand that there's going to be a lot of changes that need to be made and some expenses that are going to be incurred to do this. So coming up with some good ideas, uh, you know what I mean? So uh, again, it, it kind of makes everybody understand that if we do decide to carry on with that in ourselves, we've got to really look at a budget that what we're going to spend on this building to make it more useful. So I think it's actually a pretty good exercise. And so anyway, just wanted to comment and say, I think uh, deferral probably is a great way uh, to look at all those happens you now and hopefully we can move on one way or the other. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Is there anyone else? I don't see hands. Maybe I'll just jump in and say um, thank you for that presentation. And I'm just wondering uh, when you mentioned the, um, the special meeting or, can you just maybe outline some of the steps that you're thinking about, um, Michael, and let us know a special meeting and, and what, what does this process look like? Maybe more granular um, information at this point that you have. I know it's um, a work in process and you have mm -hmm. to plan it out, but just maybe yeah. an overview of what you're thinking. Sure, certainly, Mayor David. And that I was going to conclude with what does the next steps look like? In the staff report, I have identified um, some next steps in terms of uh, creating that partnership and forging that partnership. Um, in the report, that still would take place, but to back up the truck a little bit now, um, what a deferral does is provide a little bit more time for all stakeholders, council, the public, um, staff to take in the, the comments as they were uh, well received and gives us an opportunity to think about it a little bit more. Um, in terms of what I envision for the next few steps, uh, we would certainly work with Dr. Chant and provide more information in addition to the staff report in terms of perhaps putting an FAQ on our website uh, for staff to learn or for the public to learn more about this opportunity and uh, ahead of that and then we would then schedule um, a special council meeting dedicated to this one item so that council can give direction on whether or not to proceed with uh, the property or not and then should a decision happen we would then follow back online with the next steps in terms of ensuring that the property, uh, the building is zoned uh, to accommodate this new venture. And then followed by that, um, we're still haven't concluded with any agreement of purchase and sale, but that would ultimately be um, the concluding step. Uh, and then the site plan would follow shortly thereafter. But um, those are steps in the future. And our focus right now is to take this important decision into consideration, whether or not it's, uh, it's something council feels necessary to do. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on that? Uh, Councillor Cates. Uh, thanks for clarifying, uh, Michael. Uh, just to clarify, so would we have some kind of uh, public information or is it with the special council meeting do both things? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Cates, the special council meeting would enable uh, residents to delegate and that did provide correspondence as they've done today where we've received a lot of correspondence from the community. And so it would be strictly to deal with this sole matter. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Shipley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. To uh, Michael or, or Scott, I guess, we go forward with this mean, I'd like to see some numbers on the uh, building, Scott, if you could put the numbers, costing, what we're looking at, projecting for cost, operational costs, what we're making on it, if we're, always in the red on it. I'd just like to see some numbers on that put together for a presentation. If we go, if we move forward with the uh, council meeting. Uh, through the mayor, Councillor Shipley, absolutely. We can, uh, we can provide those numbers. Okay. Uh, Councillor Cates. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor to Scott. And just to add on there, uh, what 
uh, Wayne says, and maybe we can um, have a close look at who's renting it and, you know, who's not, um, who's renting it and, uh, you know, pre-COVID, um, just for everybody to have a clear look of what exactly has been going on uh, down there. Thank you. Yeah, if I could just jump in, I think maybe um, from the correspondence, it's probably um, a good a good way to understand what some of the gaps in understanding are or what the questions are or what the concerns are or issues that can be worked out or what the pluses and minuses are. So um, yeah, I think that'll be a, a, a way of getting all of that information. Is, um, is the clerk there? Um, I understand we did have a delegation is my understanding. Is it appropriate to ask them to come on board now? Through the chair, uh, I would say that this is the appropriate time and we do have our delegate on the line. We will Thank bring you. them Thank forward you. now. Thank you. Okay. That's better. Can you hear me now? Yes, good morning, Mr. Houghton. Um, if you'd like to start your presentation, you have 10 minutes. Yeah, that's very generous. Anyway, I'll be quicker than that. I'm surprised that I'm the only one that asked for delegation status today. But anyway, I will continue on with what I have to say. I'd uh, first thank you for the opportunity to speak. I would like to offer the following comments in opposition to declaring the Kamoka Community Center and some adjacent property a surplus. My comments will address the community center first and then address the commercial development. The staff reported two items as to why the community no longer needs the community center and six acres of park. The report identifies that the building is not cost beneficial from an operational or financial viewpoint. I say that our tax dollars are there to be used to maintain our facilities. If this rationale is applied to all other community owned facilities, then we will have many surplus properties in Middlesex Center. We should just not put a laser focus on the Kamoka Community Center when we're talking about surplus property. If this is a key factor of this decision, then a more detailed review of these expenses and revenue generation must be undertaken. Everything is expensive to maintain. I believe the community center is more than worth the cost of maintenance to the community. The report mentions that the wellness center and future Civic Square have adequate recreation community space available for residents. The Civic Square isn't here yet, so it is not contributing to any community space. The fact is that we will have less community and recreation space with this proposal and with the amount of growth in the community it doesn't make sense to reduce our inventory of these types of spaces to a private enterprise. This is a for-profit computer, uh, pardon me, this is a for-profit commercial enterprise. It will not operate like a community center. I'm very surprised about the partnership announcement too. So I won't talk to that, but I'm very surprised about that. You would also be eliminating a ground level accessible high ceiling indoor space for private and business events. The second floor meeting rooms in the wellness center are not a replacement for the com community center that can hold 330 tables and chairs with place settings, along with a fully equipped kitchen and a bar. If this center is underutilized, we should look at how we are advertising this facility and encouraging its use. The report talks to a number of reasons why this commercial enterprise will be beneficial to the community. I have a comments on a few of these. The report identifies that the municipality will benefit from additionally shared outdoor amenities and parking. I can only identify the four privately owned pickle courts as additional outdoor amenities. The additional parking is only required because of the new building. The current parking is adequate for its use. Also, the highly used two tennis courts would now be under private ownership. If this commercial development was to proceed, then the two tennis courts need to be retained as part of the municipal owned recreational facilities. A real big issue is that there will be a loss of use and enjoyment of the existing amenities to residents and youth while they are being relocated. 
It takes many years to create a soccer pitch. Regardless of the construction phases for this development, residents' enjoyment and use of the park will be significantly impacted during construction and arguably after construction when this commercial endeavor is operational. When the dust clears, users will now see about four acres of green space parkland lost to hard surface. The report identifies that funds from the sale of this property will be reinvested back into the community of Kamoka Kelworth. My response is some municipalities report the value of the surplus land. If this enterprise is paying full market value, then there are many other sites available for them to choose. Although the community deserves to know what 25% of the park is worth, the loss of their community center icon and open space is priceless. The report highlights that this economic endeavor will offer a specialized service that will benefit residents of Middlesex Center. This statement is true, but it needs to be quantified. A small portion of the community will benefit and Middlesex residents will be a very small part of this company's business. The biggest benefit will be the London and surrounding area residents at the expense of our park and community center. The report mentions that this venture is an exciting prospect for Middlesex Center as it will provide a unique health related service and additional recreational amenities and have a positive economic impact for our community. This is true, but these benefits will still be realized as this venture is built on private property. In, some, in summary, most area, most area communities struggle to keep their, their one rank, and we are lucky to have two. I am not aware of the community asking for a privately owned rink, basketball, and tennis courts. Council's response to Dr. Chant's presentation were questions about the physiotherapy portion of his business and bringing this service to Kamoka Kilworth residents. We already have two physio businesses in Kamoka Kilworth. We also have two ice rinks that we rent out. This could look like the municipality is subsidizing a commercial endeavor that is in competition with existing businesses and our own wellness facility. These are not good optics. I would ask council to direct staff to review the process of selling municipal property and to make recommendations to make it as open and fair as possible. The mention of making this a partnership would imply that this is more of an open community uh, accessible property. I believe business endeavors have to make profit and that will interfere with the community's accessibility to these amenities. Some might think the municipality was looking for an opportunity to declare the community center surplus. I truly hope that this is not the case. Even if somehow a case could be made in the future that the center is no longer needed, there could be no case made for five acres of the park being declared a surplus than having to squeeze existing amenities into a crowded footprint. Opportunities to add amenities to the wellness center are limited with the sale of the land to the north. If the center is deemed surplus, then this is one of the many proposals that should be considered along with lots of advertising that the center is for sale. I also, need no men I also need to mention that this endeavor is not fulfilling a community need to the magnitude to justify the selling of the property below market value. And I refer you to procurement law, bylaw Q section five, just in case we were considering selling this property below market value. Benefit from this development to the community is not, to give up, is not enough to give up parkland or the community center. Middlesex Center should be flattered about Dr. Chan's interest to build in Middlesex Center, and he's more than welcome to buy up private land to make his dreams a reality. I can't believe that this council wants to be on record as the ones that killed the Kamoka Community Center and five acres of green space that surrounds it. Council needs to vote no in declaring the community center a surplus. Council also needs to assure the community that any discussion about closing any community center will be based on fact with lots of time for the community to be involved in the decision. And the bottom line is, I'm adding this now, uh, if this in true is a partnership and we're looking for community centers to be closed, we need to look at all community centers in Middlesex Center. And I would, for that, I would say thank you. Peace to Ukraine. Thank you for that presentation and um, your timing is excellent. 
Well, um, at this point, we have a motion before us, and uh, that is to defer uh, this matter to a future meeting, a special meeting down the road. That is, make no decision today. Um, did you want to maybe word that in a more clerk-like manner, clerk? Or is that adequate? Through the chair, you have uh, essentially captured it, but I'd be happy to read back the uh, motion as I understand it. And the motion I under, as I understand it would be that report CAO 10-2022 regarding the declaration of surplus property for the Kamoka Community Centre be deferred to a future meeting date. Thank you. Uh, could I have a mover please and a seconder? Councillor Cates and Councillor uh, Heffernan, anyone opposed? That is carried. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, moving to item 8.2, which is the um, report on the right to disconnect le legislation. And this is again, our CAO, Michael DeLulo presenting. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through the chair to members of the council, uh, this report is in regards to uh, provincial correspondence that, uh, or provincial legislation, sorry, uh, that has uh, received assent. Uh, it's uh, with respect to the Working for Workers Act 2021. And what it is, is a policy that uh, organizations that have a certain number of people must uh, create uh, with respect to a right to disconnect uh, with the world around us and technology and social media and what have you. Um, there's policies and procedures that, uh, that we now must have in place uh, to accommodate employees uh, as they perform their work and to um, ensure that there's um, a service that's provided uh, when they have the right to disconnect. And so the report uh, outlines a policy that's appended and uh, some of the points uh, of the policy or that where absolutely necessary communication and off hours will exist for emergency purses or, or extraordinary uh, needs. Uh, so having said that, there are senior managers of this corporation where we are uh, switched on. Uh, we, we, we keep it upon ourselves and we have a good understanding with each other in terms of when to uh, notify one another in off hours in the evenings or on weekends. Uh, however, there are times that arise like the, the COVID-19 pandemic where we, where senior staff will need to have come together, and we recognize that through this policy, um, we do have protective measures that for employees, so that they are not obligated to respond during the off hours. Um, especially as we embrace new technologies, one that comes to mind is our cloud permit system. Our building permit system is now fully automated, where our uh, building department can check 24/7 at all hours of the night. So. It's incumbent upon managers to set that uh, service level expectation with our staff, and this policy will help us achieve that. Um, it also sets clear expectations when speaking to staff as it relates to communication and responding during the working hours uh, and during the off working hours, and just ensuring that we have the, the appropriate work plans. And I think that's what's uh, key to this policy is making sure that we have work plans that are in place for our staff to ensure that they are able to perform their work during uh, working hours and so that it does, it's not um, disturb, disturbative uh, to their off work time. And so this policy is just in accordance with provincial legislation. Um, we have shared it uh, with the, our other lower tier municipalities and I believe they are putting something in place before their councils as well. Um, I am happy to take any questions members of council. Thank you. I'll look to councillors for questions on this item. Uh, We'll start with you, Councillor Shipley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a comment more than anything, Michael. And I, I think some of this has come about from uh, the working at home um, issues. I know I spoke to you one time and you said quite often, if you're doing something, 4.30's come, you just continue on doing the project, whatever you're doing. Um, I know friends and some immediate family are in the same situation for working from home. Um, and one example I use is a friend of my wife's it was on a Zoom call at eight o'clock at night and so she called back and said, what's the reason for this? Well, the girl during the day had too many, uh, too many distractions. Her kids were home from school, sick and everything. So there we have a situation where one employee could not commit their or fulfill their commitment of working at home. And the other employee who has fulfilled their commitment is now doing a Zoom meeting to continue. So I just wonder if some of this hasn't been brought on by the working at home. Yeah, through the chair to uh, Councillor Shipley, that's an excellent comment. I think it's a combination of factors that have uh, contributed to this type of legislation. 
I think having uh, phones, uh, being learning to shut it off is, uh, is something that's hard to do, especially when you're a manager of an organization. And uh, I think for me personally, I think it's just uh, communication and having a good understanding uh, across the board with staff uh, to ensure that we're not, uh, we're treating them respectfully and we're not um, overbearing when it comes to, you know, making sure that the expectation is clearly set so to not infringe. And there are times from time to time where, let's face it, assignments are need to happen or we need to get uh, something done. And I think it's creating that flexible working uh, relationship. And we've tried to create that culture here at Middlesex Centre. So um, I have no uh, issues putting this policy before council because we have that culture and understanding with our managers and staff. And um, I just feel that once this gets passed, there'll be added communication to staff that I'll be sending out to ensure that we continue to respect these guidelines. Councillor Cates. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor, to Michael, or a comment too, is that not only, uh, you know, I think it's way bigger than working from home, but maybe that's even added to it even more. I know I certainly would like the opportunity to unplug, but uh, you know, I, I can't put my phone down. Anyways, um, I think that the other side of this that it does is that it takes some pressure off the person that does need to disconnect. Uh, you know, it's okay to disconnect. Um, and, you know, we don't have the right to be mad at somebody like I tech, I, I messaged you last night at eight o'clock and you didn't respond to me till this morning. You know, like you can't put that onto somebody and, uh, um, you know, that person can feel that I have a right to disconnect. So I think that, you know, it can help with some pressures of it. And I think having it actually written in a policy so everybody understands it is is really good. Okay. Uh, Councillor Heffernan. Um, yes, I think it's uh, through the mayor to Michael. I think it's a great policy. And um, yes, I've noticed too that, that staff will answer questions sometimes in the evening. And I don't expect that, especially on a weekend. I don't expect to see anything in my inbox until, you know, Monday morning. And yet here they are answering everything. And um, uh, so sometimes I actually preface the email with, don't answer this until Monday because I don't want anybody thinking about work when you're not at work. Um, so I guess for me, it would be like, for example, if, if you're pre COVID, if you're in the office from let's say eight to four or whatever it was. And if for instance, you stayed a bit later to finish a project, then I think that's, you know, that's okay to still be connected. Uh, and if you are able to work eight to four, continue like from home then that should be your hours and that's it now sometimes obviously there's going to be interruptions that you don't have at work such as the dog has to be let out the phone rings you know whatever um I guess you just figure out how to work that into your schedule but uh yes I think it's it's good I don't expect staff to be on call on the weekends other than um or evenings other than emergencies and um I think this is good because as you mentioned, phones connect everybody, and uh, except me, I don't have any apps on mine, but um, most people do, and so yeah, they're they're always connected. And um, I just, I think this is a way where it's positive to make sure that you do disconnect. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I don't see any hands. Um, I just have one little comment. Um, Policies are, I think the policy is great and policies are needed. And um, I think working through um, informing staff, educating, reinforcing is good. Um, but how will we know that we are successful? Because I still have a niggling, I, I, there are certain kinds of personalities that will it's hard to wean off people when they're used to doing things in a certain way. We're changing habits and, and, and uh, ways of thinking and acting. I'm just wondering, is there any way, you know, we have some numbers on this or we know that we've done better or we're improving over time or, or could you speak to that maybe and just say, yeah, yeah? well, thank you. Yeah, sure. That's a good comment, Mayor David, uh, through the mayor to the members of council. Um, I equate that 
to learning and understanding. And I think as I initiated, not so much the KPI of this, but more communication and questions and understanding to staff. So we set that tone and we that culture in our organization to truly understand what, uh, what urgency there is. And that's incumbent upon the senior managers of the organization to ensure that um, if there's something urgent, we will dial in and connect with one another. Uh, but that's setting that tone and making sure that staff are aware. And we're starting to do that more and more uh, with uh, how we communicate with, un with one another so that there's an understanding. We we've been talking about saving uh, your emails and sending them during working hours, even if they're on the, because I always get thoughts in the evening or uh, during the weekend. So it's instead of sending it, you know, save it and it'll get sent out on Monday or Tuesday. And it's just learning these new processes to be respectful of one another. And um, I truly believe we have the staff to accomplish that. And uh, now it's just putting it into practice. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. And if there are no further questions, uh, then the motion before us is that report CAO number 9, 2022, regarding the right to disconnect legislation be received and that the right to disconnect policy appended to the report be approved. Is there a mover please and a seconder? Our Councillor Shipley and Councillor Cates. Is anyone opposed? Uh, seeing none, that is um, uh, that is approved. And we can move now to item 8.3, uh, which will be our Director of Community Services, Scott Mayers, presenting on the Delaware Baseball Diamond. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good morning again, Council. Uh, just to touch on this uh, Council report uh, in front of you. Um, as many of you know, uh, Larry Gates uh, was a longtime member of our Community Services Advisory Committee. Um, working with him since uh, 2012. Uh, he's a, a longtime resident of Delaware and has been uh, a huge part of the Delco Bridge Minor Baseball Association for 30 plus years. Um, unfortunately, his, his passing uh, last uh, August uh, left a big hole in both the organization, uh, uh, the baseball organization, uh, the Delaware community, and certainly with us on the Community Services Advisory Committee and those who sit on the committee with me uh, know his and have sat in, on the committee in the past, know that his contributions were, were certainly valued. Uh, we were approached by Delco Bridge uh, Minor Baseball uh, with the hopes to rename the uh, Delaware main field uh, in, on his behalf or in his behalf. Um, so I'm just, that's the report in front of you today is to uh, seek approval to uh, work with the uh, uh, my Baseball Association, along with uh, uh, Larry's children as well, in finding an appropriate uh, name that uh, would suit that uh, that facility. The he he spent a lot of time uh, over the years. Uh, he had a vision for many of these uh, these these ball diamonds. Uh, often will be sending me pictures and ideas, and you know, really truly wanted uh, the best for for those fields. And 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 I think with his. Uh, um, support and and vision. We, uh, we've we've enhanced uh, um, a couple of a field of fields in the Kamoka Delaware area, and that's thanks to to his uh, um, you know initiation. So uh, we feel that's a, a nice way to honor uh, his his legacy and his contributions to uh, to the community. Um, further to that, we are also working with the. Uh, Delco Bridge Minor Baseball Association on a scoreboard donation. As I noted, uh, Larry's long-term, uh, long-time em employer, cooperators group are looking to donate a scoreboard um, in his memory. Uh, this is a very uh, nice asset to have uh, on, on a new field that's been expanded and renovated. Um, so we will be working with them on the installation of that through the donation policy. Um, so happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. I look to councillors for questions or comments. I don't see any hands. I, I'll jump in and say I can't agree more. Um, um, he's definitely going to be missed by um, more than just the uh, baseball, I mean, uh, the, uh, the uh, committee. Sorry, my computer is not behaving here. Um, uh, here we go. Um, He's certainly going to be missed by more than just our, our committee. Um, I say the hole he's left in uh, local uh, baseball is definitely great. And I couldn't agree more with the, um, the, the, the motion that we have before us. Um, 
And that motion is that report CMS 05 2022 regarding Delaware Main baseball diamond renaming request be received. And that the letter dated February 23rd, 2022 from Delco Bridge Minor Baseball Association be received. And further, that the staff be authorized to work with the Delco Bridge Minor um, Baseball Association in renaming the existing ball diamond known as Delaware Main to a mutually agreed upon name. Is there a mover, please, and a seconder? Uh, we have Councillor Scott and Councillor, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan, pardon me. Is anyone opposed? Uh, seeing none, then that is carried. Uh, we can now move on to item four, 8.4, pardon me, and Ruth Joyce Maynard, our Human Resources Coordinator, will provide, provide an overview of this report. Uh, the floor is yours. Through you, Mayor David. I think we're just waiting for her to be promoted to the screen. Yeah. There she is. She's coming. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, the floor is yours, Joyce, if you'd like to uh, give us a report. Great. Um, so uh, the members of council have had an opportunity to review and comment on our draft diversity, equity and inclusion policy. And this is a new policy for council's consideration today. Uh, this policy outlines the principles and actions Middlesex Centre will take towards building an open, accessible, equitable, diverse and inclusive workplace and community. Uh, throughout the municipality of Middlesex Centre, we support diversity, equity and inclusion in all forms and reject discrimination based on age, disability, economic circumstance, marital and family status, ethnicity, gender, gender identity and gender expression, race, religion and sexual orientation, among others. Inclusion, equity and diversity are shared responsibilities. Achieving diversity requires a commitment to human dignity, equity and inclusion and must find full expression in our organizational culture, values, norms and behaviors. This policy is our first step towards a journey to reflect the needs of our diverse population and our employee base. And as we continue through this journey, we will continue to learn, grow and improve along the way. The goal is to have diversity, equity and inclusion embedded in everything we do. Under this policy, we will be addressing hiring, hiring and employee retention, training, continuous improvement, monitoring and reporting, and actionable strategies to support diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and, and just a quick update is our staff did complete an introductory online training module in February of this year, and we are sourcing in-person training for our staff and our uh, council and leadership team, hopefully in May. Um, and we also wanted to note that we'd like to acknowledge uh, the region of Waterloo, City of Oshawa, City of London, City of Stratford and Town of Georgina um, without their policies and support uh, and sharing of information. Um, we've incorporated some of their ideas into our format. Thank you. Um, I will now turn to Council for questions or clarification, comments. Councillor Cates. Through you, Madam Mayor, to uh, this little team here, I just want to say you did a fantastic job and I think it's wonderful. Anyone else? I don't see any hands. Well, um, I will then ask that we um, look at the motion, which is that report. CPS 07-2022 regarding diversity, equity and inclusion policy be received and that the diversity, equity and inclusion policy appended to the report CPS 07-22, uh, pardon me, 2022 be approved. Is there a mover please and a seconder? Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Brennan and seconded by Councillor Heffernan. Uh, any opposed? Seeing none, that is carried then. Thank you for that report, Ruth. And um, we can now move on to 8.5, which is an application for a draft plan subdivision. Uh, and Marion, our planner, is here to give us the report. Good morning. 
Good morning. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good morning to you and to Council. Uh, so this staff report is intended to provide a recommendation to Council with regard to the official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and plan of subdivision applications for the Poplar Woods development proposal in the Hamlet area of Poplar Hill. So I will just share my screen very quickly, just to put up a location map. hopefully everyone um, can see the location map on the screen. Um, so the Poplar Woods um, application proposes a total of 10 building lots for single family homes that range in size from 0 0.2 uh, to 4. 2.48 hectares in area. Um, there is a large block proposed on the southern portion of the lands and that's proposed to be reserved for open space as a result of the significant woodland and wetlands and regulated area that run through that property. The official plan amendment application is requesting that a special policy area is applied to the lands in order to permit the creation of 10 lots on private services. Uh, the official plan policies only limit the development of plans of subdivision with three or more lots to full municipal services. Um, and of course, this amendment does not change the designation of the land, so it will remain as a Hamlet designation. Um, the applicant is also requesting to rezone the land to an open space um, zone, and of course this would only apply to uh, the woodlot or the, what's considered Block 11, as well as consider um, rezoning the developable area to a Hamlet residential first density zone for the lands um, for blocks, sorry, 1 to, uh, to 10. And of course uh, the Hamlet residential zone is consistent with some of the zoning within the Poplar Hill area. Um, so this application started a few years ago, but in January 2021, staff presented the applications at a public meeting along with two other development proposals within the Hamlet and advised the public that we would consider all these applications concurrently to address the impact from new development to uh, the water quality and quantity in the area as a result of the servicing. Um, concerns. Um, so the applicant provided the municipality with the appropriate reports and studies, including a hydrogeological assessment, which was pre-reviewed by third-party consultants on behalf of the municipality. Um, since this, um, the uh, January 2021 meeting, um, the proponent has also initiated a town hall meeting, which occurred earlier this year, as well as a subsequent public meeting was held in March 2022. Um, at the March 22 meeting, um, council and the public had requested that a preliminary grading plan kind of identify and be provided by the applicant to show that these laws can in fact be developed. So I will uh, just switch to um, that screen right now. Um, and I do apologize that this uh, grading plan was intended to be part of my staff report. I think I just missed it. It was um, attached, so it is available for review by the public or by council if necessary. Um, and you can see on this preliminary grading plan, um, there is identification of a building lot for, sorry, the um, a building lot for a dwelling. It's not necessarily a building envelope but just shows that a dwelling could be located um, of approximately 290 square meters on the property as well as shows uh, the septic system, a well, and contingency area for each of the lots as well as enough room for any accessory uses or structures located on the property. Um, staff have reviewed the comments from the public and from council, as well as the information provided by the applicant and have considered them to ensure negative impacts and risks from the development are negated or minimized as much as possible. So with regard to the official plan amendment, staff reviewed and requested, uh, sorry, staff reviewed the requested amendment and are satisfied that the, this amendment to permit the development of 10 units on private services can represent limited infill within an existing settlement area and can be supported where no municipal services are planned or provided. Uh, staff have also considered the zoning bylaw amendment request to note that the general HR1 zone can be appropriate with a few site specific standards. And this is really to reflect some of the comments from municipal staff as well as agencies. Um, so for um, some of these site specific standards, they address uh, permitted uses. So in, in this case, we'd only permit dwelling and accessory use as well as a home occupation. Um, the site specific standards also address enhanced side yard setbacks to increase the separation between dwellings on each lot. Um, there is also clarification of the setback from Ilderton Road, and that's maintained for all the lots that either front onto Ilderton Road or side onto Ilderton Road. Um, and as well, uh, the county staff have also included a maximum floor area to be 
um, capped at 300 square meters to ensure that there is sufficient developable space for the dwelling as well as servicing and any other proposed future structures such as like shed or a pool, for example. Um, as well, building um, setbacks uh, were incorporated from the Imperial Oil Pipeline that runs through the property. Um, so I will note that the applicant and staff have further reviewed the zoning bylaw amendment in, in great detail, and um, staff would generally be satisfied to remove that maximum floor area provision since the lock are sufficiently sized to allow for a slightly bigger dwelling if necessary and still have room for servicing as well as any accessory buildings or uses in the future. Um, additionally, we have received clarification from Imperial Oil regarding their setback requirement, and they have noted no dwelling unit or attached garage can be located within a 20 meters of the pipeline. However, accessory uses or structures can be located within this 20 meter setback that is subject to approval from Imperial Oil. Um, staff have also recommended that a holding symbol be applied to the developable area of the, um, the subdivision, and this can be removed when the subdivision agreement is entered into with the municipality. Um, and finally, staff recommend that block 11, so it's the larger block with the, um, the wood lot um, contained in it, be rezoned to a site-specific open space zone to ensure that this, um, this area is only used for conservation purposes and no buildings or structures can be erected on it. And uh, lastly, with regard to the plan of subdivision, staff recommend draft plan approval subject to 36 conditions that speak to a variety of requirements, including uh, servicing, uh, land dedication and improvements to the roadway, as well as access to the county road, uh, further study and review of the technical and engineering components um, related to the subdivision, including stormwater management, protection of the natural heritage area, a requirement for homeowners Edu sorry, education guide that details and informs um, future landowners about normal farm practices in the area, uh, maintenance of the septic system and use of water softeners and road salts, as well as a condition related to the easements and setbacks from the Imperial Oil um, gas line. Uh, so given the aforementioned and review of all the comments that we have received over the years from the public agencies and council, as well as municipal staff, planning is satisfied that the applications can be supported and is consistent with the provincial policy statement and in conformity with the county and Middlesex Center official plan. As such, staff recommend adoption of the official plan amendment, um, approval of the zoning bylaw amendment as amended, and that Middlesex Center recommend draft plan approval to the county subject to draft plan. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you for that report. Um, I'll look to councillors. Is there anyone? Oh, councillors Cates, and then I have councillor Heffernan and Scott. Thank you, through you. Hi, Marian. Um, I just had a couple questions. I was hoping that I could get my hand up before your map disappeared. I was wondering where exactly is in this hole in the drawing that you're just using that drawing as a location area. Um, or uh, site plan sort of. Um, I was curious where exactly the Imperial Oil Pipeline was. Um, and so just to clarify, there's there will be three of the lots will have their driveways off of Ilderton Road and the rest will be off of the Bowling Green. Uh, yes, uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Case, that's correct. Um, with regard to the um, access off of Illusion Road, um, there would be one access to, sorry, Lot 10. I'll just share my screen, it'll be easier <laughs> to, to review this. Um, okay, so we'll have uh, one access to Lot 10. Lot 9 would be extended um, or have an access off of Bowling Green Drive, and then lots one and two would have a shared access onto Ilderton Road, and that's just to limit the accesses there. Mm -hmm. um, and then with regard to the Imperial Oil uh, Pipeline, you can see this um, kind of diagonal running right through the properties. That's why they are a little bit irregularly shaped. Um, and this would, um, you can kind of see the width here, but would recommend the, the Imperial Oil Pipeline easement. Um, and then the pipeline runs directly or close to the center of this um, easement. So, so then there is, you mentioned a 20 meter setback from Imperial Oil. Uh, I, I don't know that off the top of my head how much that is, six, what that is in feet. But so um, on that drawing, you showed the septic beds, 
Uh, so there's going to be the 20 meters. I guess you're saying that it's only from the house, 20 meters just from the house. The septic bed is okay. And then if they built a shed, that would be okay as well. Exactly. So any livable or habitable area um, has to be located outside of that 20 meter area from the pipeline. Um, and I did confirm with Imperial Oil that this does include the an attached garage. Um, anything that's accessory, so a shed, um, like a pool, any servicing, um, could be located within that 20 meter setback. However, it is subject to approval from Imperial Oil. So then, um, uh, two more things. So then the, um, just, I'm, I'm going to forget it. This is a, uh, so then the use, are you saying that you're taking away the restriction on the size of the house? I mean, what does it matter what the size of the house is as long as it's 20 meters away from, and it meets the side yard setbacks or, or all the yes. setbacks? So the, uh, the restriction on the house was more so related to uh, the ability to have on-site servicing on the property. So one of the concerns with this development and the other two is that if there is a, a larger house and based on the gross floor area of the house, um, that servicing, including septic and well and contingency area couldn't be located and physically fit on the property. Um, however, uh, it, staff have kind of reviewed the layouts and the preliminary grading plan and we're generally okay with uh, with removing that cap. Um, so right now the cap was at around 300 square meters, which is just over, you know, 3,000 square feet um, for a home. Um, so it, there, but there would still be enough um, size on each property if uh, a larger home was proposed on it and a uh, larger septic system or area would need to be installed. So then on the, uh, like, let's say somebody was going to build a shed, they're probably fine um, as far as Imperial Oil is concerned, but what if they were going to um, put in a pool? Some of those people with their septic, by the time they get their septic, they may not have. And so part of my thought is, will that be pointed out to people and then Lastly, will it become a part of the this people's you know general knowledge, not just in buying these now, but in the future, that you have a pipeline, you have a pipeline right at your back door. Right, exactly. So the um, proposed zoning bylaw amendment would address um, the setback requirements for any accessory structures or uses. So that does include a swimming pool or anything else that doesn't necessarily um, require a building permit. So there might be some other activities that um, might be considered accessory to the main dwelling um, that could be located, um, sorry, on, on a personal property that may not require a building permit. So like a structure that is less than let's say 100 square feet, uh, they would still need to have approval from Imperial Oil to be located within that 20 meter setback. Um, so that is clearly defined within the zoning bylaw amendment that we had proposed. Um, additionally, there would need to be easements um, and this would be identified on anything that's registered uh, on title with the, with the land. Thank you, Marianne. I have Councillor Heffernan next. Uh, through the mayor to um, Marion, um, just a couple of clarifications. So I noticed that um, M no, yeah, MTE consultant did a peer assessment of the hydrological report by JFM um, uh, JFM Environmental. Um, on page two of that, there's review comment that says there's insufficient data to assess all questions about the water quality. Um, and one, one assessment had the, the had unhealth related incidents on the water quality. And under agency comments on page 11, it suggests that consideration must be made of water quality and qual quantity impacts uh, and that submitted studies are under review. Is this part of the reason for the holding symbol on there? And will the holding symbol basically take care of that situation? Yeah, so essentially as part of the draft plan conditions, um, the applicant would still need to provide a more comprehensive study to confirm that there definitely is not any significant impacts to the water quality or quantity. Um, so. Um, and if Rob's online, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the reports that were provided were 
preliminary and um, based on the information that they had available, but that does not um, hinder or preclude the applicant from providing the uh, more com pro sorry, comprehensive review and study um, prior to final approval of the subdivision as well as um, prior to any development occurring on site. So there's still a lot more work that needs to be done by the proponent. Um, and the, the H1 symbol essentially would incorporate um, those kind of findings. So the H1 symbol is essentially a holding symbol that would uh, require a subdivision agreement. Um, and the municipality would incorporate some of the findings from um, the further study, as well as any other technical requirements for the subdivision into that subdivision agreement. Okay, so basically, um we're not just giving them a blanket approval here. It's subject to all these confirmations of studies and maybe a little bit deeper. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and then one other question I had, um, the open space at the back. Um, now I notice there's gonna be a, a fence, a chain link fence and a locked gate there. So is this um, to exclude all, um, residents from there or um, will they have access or how will they have access if it's locked? Um, just curious as to how that's gonna work. That's a great question. So one of the um, draft plan conditions is to actually address um, ownership and maintenance of that block for the future. So it wouldn't necessarily be a publicly municipal owned um, block that where people can walk through. Um, there would need to be some type of ownership arrangement um, negotiated out through, um, and it will be identified through the subdivision agreement as well. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Scott. I don't have to see you. Are you there? There you are. I'm here. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you to uh, well, maybe possibly Rob, uh, I just want to refer to, I know one of the conditions is uh, for the zoning is obviously to be able to accommodate sewer, or, uh, septics and, uh, and uh, wells in this case. Um, I, I just want to bring up an instance. I noticed the our zoning is the minimum lot area is 0.5 of an acre, which is half of an acre. We got a scenario here in Delaware where we approved a couple severances uh, just about a year and a half ago. And I believe they were very close to half an acre. It turns out, of course, one of the conditions was to meet uh, the septic approval and they were unable to do that. Um, so it's been proven that in Delaware right now, uh, you require a 0.85 of an acre uh, because I think it was said to me that Middlesex Center has adopted a clean water policy and we want it to be a leader that way. So I realize that's a condition and, and their problem. I guess my question is, um, that would be specifically based because it's in Delaware and now Coal Stream would have to be tested that, that how the percolation and all that, so that the size there, half an acre may be accommodated for septics. Up or yeah, and maybe you you know the one I'm referring to and what's happened here. I just think if we're going to give approval for septic or for severances, but it's impossible to get a septic, then you know we need to relook at that. Yep. Okay. So yes. Yeah, so through Madam Mayor to Councillor Scott again, I apologize. I, I missed a little snippet of that, but I, I think I, I I got the gist of it. Um, the so we are applying the same policy both locations, um, which is what has cause the issue in in Delaware with that request. I have a feeling I know which site you're referring to. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the lot sizes um, exactly, but it it was the same engineer that has has worked on both of those. And um, so I I, 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 like, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I think that the lots in Delaware that were being proposed must be smaller. Um, otherwise, because it is a, essentially comes down to a dilution calculation uh, for the nitrates. Um, and it's, we are, trying to make sure that we take a consistent approach across the board. Okay, yeah, that's the, the most recent one that we've done on Harris Road, the septic. Uh, <clears throat> I know the same engineer did that and he required 0.85 of an acre. That was, that, that he couldn't do any less than that to accommodate a septic. Again, the conditions in Coldstream maybe are different too, right? and I understand that. So I was just kind of curious. So it, yeah, so it depends on two, a couple of things. So it depends on whether it's the, soil types driving the size of the septic bed or if it's because of the nitrate calculation. If it's the nitrate ca calculation, it really shouldn't matter from one location to the next because it's really about dilution. Um, but I'm happy to review that again. But yeah, th 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 there will be a reason for it. 
For sure. No, I understand that. And and I realize it's one of their conditions, so it's not really our issue right now, but I, I hate to see things granted. And then we already know that the chances of them get a septic are, are, are slim. <laughs> so that's just a comment. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Oh, yes, Councillor Arts, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not sure if these comments are appropriate now or later, but this is my award and I'm going to eat this one. I know people aren't happy about it, but to date, the developers complied all the necessary documents and final approval. There's 36 conditions that have to be met. And I know when this was going on last year, people wanted to know how I was going to vote. So is it appropriate to say now? Well, I'll be calling the vote if, um, if, when you're finished, unless someone else wants to speak to it, if you want to yeah, highlight I, your vote, I, I don't have any. It's your turn want, to comment. Well, I, I will be voting yes. Okay, thank you. Is anyone else wanting to weigh in on anything? Uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan. Through you, Madam Mayor, to Marion. Um, <clears throat> We've got like three areas here that are, are coming forward. And under the PPS, does it not state that anything over so many lots should be on full services? Now, is the developer trying to get around this by bringing one forward now and then one forward later as separate entities so that the PPS doesn't come into play with full services. Now, what's your take on that? Is, is if all three of these were to come forward at once, they would probably have to be on full services. But by bringing one forward now and, and the other ones later, does that negate the requirement for full services? Can you weigh in on that? Sure, through you, uh, Madam Mayor, to Deputy Mayor Brennan. Um, the requirements in the PPS is actually a hierarchy. So there isn't, you know, like a trigger. Once you get over a certain threshold, you are automatically requiring full um, municipal services. So there is a requirement, um, or sorry, the preference to have full municipal services for any new development within a settlement area. Um, and then if that can't be accommodated or if it's not planned for that settlement area, then you can look at other options, including partial servicing, uh, communal servicing, and then of course, private servicing, if that is the last available option and if it's appropriate for the site. Did you hear everything you needed, Thank Deputy? Thank you. Okay. I think so, yeah. Okay, I, I, you cut out of part of mine, Mary, and that was why I was checking in. Okay, um, I don't see any hands. So the motion before us is that the official plan amendment number 38, official plan amendment 38 for the land legally described as concession eight, part lot six, RP 33R18785, parts eight to 10 in the former township of Lobo, Municipality of Middlesex Center be adopted and forwarded to the County of Middlesex for consideration of approval. And that the zoning bylaw, pardon me, zoning bylaw amendment application to rezone the subject property from existing use, exception two zone to the site specific Hamlet residential first density, exception 12, withhold um, H, uh, holdings R, HR1 dash 12 H1 and open space exception eight, for the property legally described as concession eight, part lot six, as described um, in the previous paragraph. And further that the county of Middlesex be advised that Middlesex Center recommends draft plan approval for the land legally known as I described earlier in the municipality of Middlesex Center, county file number 39T MC 1701, subject to the draft plan conditions appended to the report PLA 23, 2022 and subject to a three year lapse period. Is there a mover please and a seconder? I have Councillor Cates and I have uh, Councillor Scott. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, the motion is carried. Thank you for that report, Marion. And um, we can now move into uh, section nine, notice of motion. We have Councillor Scott uh, with respect to the Middlesex Centre vaccination policy. 
Um, the floor is you, uh, yours, Councillor Scott. Yes, um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so I, I, um, I know uh, there's been lots of changes going on uh, health-wise, and so I thought it was time to uh, possibly uh, uh, bring up our uh, COVID-19 vaccination uh, policy uh, that pertains to council and I think also to um, uh, to uh, people that we hire to work in the uh, Middlesex Center uh, as far as um, uh, not employees, but the people that we might hire for custom jobs and stuff like that. So um, anyway, uh, I would uh, I was thought we, if we could entertain the idea to revisit it and uh, I change it to be optional rather than mandated for the vaccinations. Uh, I think uh, I think now uh, there's been a lot of changes and I think it's evident that um, unvaccinated people um, have not been proven to spread COVID more than vaccinated people. And so I thought, well, maybe we could have a discussion about that and uh, see what the rest of the councillors think. Um, I'm thinking that we've done a lot of talking around inclusivity uh, in the past few uh, months and meetings. So I'd like to uh, have that considered as a way to make people uh, that are unvaccinated to feel inclusive. Um, because uh, it's, there's been a big, quite a big divide, I think, uh, over the COVID, and I think that would be a good place for us to start to, to consider amending some of those divisions. So I, uh, I would ask that uh, maybe I could have a second on that. I think that needs to be brought to the floor, if I'm correct. And I have Councillor Arts seconding the motion. So, um, should I read the motion for you, Councillor uh, Scott? Um, so the motion that um, Councillor um, Arts is seconding is that Councillor reconsider the application of the COVID-19 vaccination administrative policy that is CAO 25-2021 to members of Council as being optional rather than mandated. Um, is there anyone who wishes to speak to this? Uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan. Hey, Madam Mayor, um, I have an issue with this. Um, we, we passed a policy um, that uh, staff has to be vaccinated and any future employees have to be vaccinated. Um, I think as council, we are in a leadership role. I, I think it's imperative that we show leadership by uh, keeping this policy in place for council because uh, where uh, administration has put it in place for staff and future employees to be vaccinated and people coming in to work for us have to be vaccinated to protect the people that are here. So I think um, to have council show leadership and, and have this as part of council's mandate that we be vaccinated, um, I think is imperative uh, in our leadership role. So I will not support this. Uh, I will uh, continue to support that council be vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cates. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor to Brad. Um, I'm sorry, Brad, I, I, can't, uh, I can't do it. Um, I agree with what, uh, what John said. And I also wanted to add that, uh, you know, just yesterday they've, uh, you know, declared a six wave for London Middlesex. And I've been hearing all kinds of, you know, cases of COVID around us and, and um, just me personally with appointments I had and I got COVID and, it, there was like four of them. Anyways, um, I don't think that it's time yet to back off of anything. Um, I think we need to keep the status quo, quo, but I also think that John said it very well for, you know, the leadership role, et cetera. So I'm sorry, Brad, but I can't support you on this one. Thank you. Ah, uh, uh, Councillor Heffernan. Through the mayor um, to, I guess, perhaps Michael, I was just um, thinking, so can we maintain this policy? And yet right now, um, do we have uh, residents or um, 
consultants or what have you meet at the office and we don't ask them for proof of anything? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Heffernan, uh, the provincial government has updated its rules and guidelines. Um, we are doing away with the screening protocols to for members of the public. Uh, however, at the same time, we still need to ensure that we create a safe working environment. So when meeting with consultants, if they're not feeling well, uh, that's something where staff um, will use uh, common sense to ensure that they will reschedule or alter the way they uh, meet with the individual. And so uh, we want to ensure that we have protocols in place, even on a go forward basis, that we keep a safe working environment for staff. Okay. I'm just wondering if there's, um, if there's kind of a, I agree with John's remarks. Um, we have to set an example um, at the same time. I don't know if Councillor Scott wants to sit in a corner in the council chambers to be away from everybody, but I'm just, thinking um, if we allow others into the building for short periods of time, is it possible to do that with an unvaccinated um, counselor? That's the question? Basically, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm just wondering, are, are you looking for a response in terms of well, I'm just a, thinking a practical uh, staff response to, or is it a hypothetical? I'm thinking out loud. This is a question that's niggling my mind. Yes. Yes. That's basically okay. it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did see it. Oh, Councillor Scott, you wanted to jump in. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a couple of quick comments. And uh, first of all, I'll say I certainly do respect all councillors' opinions, uh, John and uh, Councillor Case. I have no, I have no problem at all. I'm speaking on behalf of um, um, many people, I, I believe, and so I just wanted to be clear on that. I, I was, you know, I respect everybody's opinion, and I'm okay with whatever answer you guys come up with. It's an awkward, it's a weird situation that we need to discuss. I wanted to bring it forward. I will probably continue to bring it forward, uh, but I wanted to be clear that our whole goal is safety, and. The evidence out there already has proven that it's not unvaccinated people that are causing unsafe situations. We can use the hospital right now, for example. There's many people, everybody in the hospital is vaccinated, I understand. That's their policy, they're there. There's many of them right on Channel 10 News now that are off because they got COVID. So they didn't get it from unvaccinated people possibly because they're at work. So again, I, I don't want to debate it all. I just want to say that I, I, I understand everybody's situation. It's really... Uh, awkward and weird. So um, uh, I just wanted to add those comments that I don't think by allowing this to happen in our, whether it's council or to employers that are coming into workforce, I don't think we're creating an unsafe workplace for everybody else. John's point of um, being consistent and being leaders, I would say, uh, yes, I would agree with. Uh, that would be a, one of my next steps is, which is not my job is to is to have that looked at again. Again, we don't decide for employees. I understand that completely. But I mean, that would be something I think we should consider in the future also. Again, we want to be inclusive. So if we think of inclusivity, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. That's not inclusive. Especially if they're not causing people uh, you know, to be sick. I mean, we really got to look at that. Again, I know it's a very tough, awkward discussion, but I just would like, I'll leave it at that and then let you. Uh, that you choose from there. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Uh, Councillor Arts. Um, <clears throat> I, <coughs> excuse me, sir, Madam Mayor. Uh, I respect Councillor Scott speaking up on the issue. That's why I second it because I think everybody is allowed their opinions and maybe down the road, I might change my mind, but right now, I, I think I'm going to go with what we've been doing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, there's only one thing um, I, 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 that hasn't been said that has been weighing on my mind as well is the uh, extent to which um, there are individuals in, in, in every situation who have 
reasons to hope that they can be as safe as possible. And as part of that safety, um, vaccination is one tick, tick in the box. Um, it's those vulnerable people and or their families that um, I am aware of because they don't have a choice about whether they have a vaccination or not and to come to work or to wonder if they're going to be compromised in some way is stressful for them. And I think um, that is that safety piece is something that that is um, important in, in my thinking as well. Um, I recognize that things are always fluid and changing with COVID. And I recognize that there um, are opinions that range from one end of the spectrum to the other. Uh, I think that's what makes it particularly hard um, inclusivity for me is, is important. Um, I don't define inclusivity in terms of things that I can choose to do or not choose to do. Uh, for me, inclusivity is uh, accepting people the way they are in terms of um, factors that they necessarily can't control. So to the extent that um, we're, we're targeting people or, or, or that, I, I don't think we're, we're, I don't think that is the intent here at all. Um, so say for me, it's more the vulnerable people or the people who have children who are under five, who have babies at home, that kind of thing that um, also preys on my mind. So um, if there's nothing else, then um, I've read the motion and we have um, we had our mover, uh, the proponent and Council Arts seconded it. I'll call the vote then. Um, is Oh, I guess I should call it both ways. I'll look. Um, all in favor of, of the motion. Um, of the motion, which is to make it optional rather than mandated, just to be clear. All in favor and opposed? And that motion um, is not um, passed. Uh, thank you for that conversation, everyone. And uh, we should now move to correspondence. We have um, 86 items. If there's nothing to comment on in any of these, there are the um, reports from the conservation authorities and water compliance report, health unit report. If there's nothing there, then the motion before us is that council for the municipal. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Case. Yes. Uh, thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, I just want to thank everybody that sent in their letters. Thank you. Um, so the motion before us is that the council for the municipality of Middlesex Center receives correspondence items. 10.1 through 10.86 as information. A mover, please. And a seconder, Councillor Heffernan, Councillor Arts. Is anyone opposed? Seeing none, that motion is carried then. I'll look to the Deputy Mayor now for a County Council update, please. Yes, um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I will be brief since County Council yesterday lasted 19 minutes. So there wasn't a lot on the agenda. Um, we did receive uh, notice from uh, Councillor um, Smith from Adelaide Metcalf that he was going to be bringing a notice of motion forward uh, concerning crosswalks. So that is upcoming. Um, we passed a boring bylaw uh, with, for a line of credit of up to $2 million. Uh, the server and storage for IT infrastructure um, is being replaced at $131,000. Uh, renewal agreement with Bell Canada for 911, which will um, be the next generation uh, 911 service, which will not only include voice 911, um, Strathmere Lodge is continuing on with its vaccination policy. And uh, Middlesex County Day, uh, uh, we're finally going to be able to get back to that after a couple of years absent, will be May the 12th at the Thorndale Community Center. So that's Middlesex County Day, which councillors are invited to attend also, is uh, May the 12th in Thorndale. Uh, that is the gist of the meeting. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Um, the only other thing I saw there was the Warden's Golf Tournament, which was uh, reiterated, as, reiterated as a calendar item on 23rd of June. That's Thursday. I think the county will be sending yep, out. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that update. Yep. Um, is there any other business that anyone would like to um, bring up now? I see no hands. 
In that case, um, we can move to bylaws. And the bylaw uh, motion is that bylaws 2022 number 19 through 2022 number 20, as well as bylaws 2022 32, 33, 35, 36 be adopted as printed. And that bylaw 2022 number 34 uh, be adopted as amended. Uh, could I have a mover, please, and a seconder for that motion? Uh, Councillor Scott and uh, Councillor Shipley. Is anyone opposed? Uh, seeing none, then uh, the final um, by, um, motion today is that the Council for the Municipality of Middlesex Centre adjourns the April 6th, 2022 Council meeting at 12.09 p.m. And a mover for that, please. Seconder, Councillor Cates and Councillor Heffernan. Is anyone opposed? I don't see any. Thank you everyone um, for your efforts today. There was a lot of content and a lot of discussion and uh, it's all appreciated.